my name is Abbebe Shmelis. I'm the director of research uh, hosting the opening session uh, on this uh, training uh, on policy briefs. You are all warmly welcome. I hope uh, you have traveled well, those of you who have come from far, and those of you also from uh, Nairobi, uh, again, a uh, warm welcome to you. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I would just like to introduce uh, ARC's Executive Director, Professor Jugunan Dungu, uh, who will be sharing his thoughts uh, why we are here today and what we expect in the next three days uh, from this uh, experience. Uh, and then uh, we share as we go along uh, um, uh, so that you benefit to the maximum from the experiences in this room. Uh, so I uh, welcome uh, the executive director to give his just opening remarks. Thanks. Thank you very much and good morning everyone. As you can see I'm not in a tie like my colleague it's because I thought it was a resting day, but we don't rest, it, it, we work throughout, and that's the AERC. And thank you very much that um, I'm here to talk about uh, training for policy briefs. And it's quite uh, something interesting because I've been on both sides myself. And so it means that it's going to be strange actually thinking about um, the totality of training. But the most important thing is that being here, and let me say, Abebe, is, this, is, this is an experience for AERC in the last two and a half years. We have not had an in-person meeting. What we have learned from the virtual meeting is that it has been very, very prompt in terms of time. It has been very, very efficient because you take it from your, the comfort of your place. But here we have to bring you together and we sit together. There are advantages for that but there are also disadvantages. But let's say that we have come through a very difficult period, especially because of the COVID pandemic, but I do believe that we shall overcome and we're going to into, into a new maybe wave, but what we have is lessons accumulated. Anyway, that is for now. Let me say that uh, today's um, topic is training for policy, how do you develop a policy brief after working on your research? And then uh, that is what we are going to take up. Is it the next two, three days? And uh, there are three groups here. They are all organized in terms of the projects that we have covered. I will be talking about that briefly. So for me, it's very, very important. And there are also some people who are online, isn't it? It's another experience because hybrid is actually maybe the way to go because there are people who still find it difficult. I'm still finding it also very difficult to travel. You know, there are countries that require that even when you get to their country, you have to get a COVID test. After 72 hours, you get another test. You know, it's a nuisance and at the airport. But anyway, we know we have come from far. We have come from a situation where we were all locked down, but now it has changed. Anyway, today, let me, I was just asked to provide some opening remarks, so I don't want to be the main uh, the main guy dealing with the issues here. Let me be the, let's see, is it moving? Oh, okay. First of all, let me talk about AERC and our approach to capacity building and even knowledge generation in Sub-Saharan Africa. And for those of you who know this, we have been on it. This is the 34th year. So we must have created some influence. But more importantly, we continue getting fresh ideas and even fresh people, and we want to make sure that we understand that. In fact, when you look at all our network of capacity building and institutional networking, the last component, policy outreach, is where we are. After providing our own research output, we want to make sure that we communicate through our program of uh, communication and policy outreach. And this is where we are. But we'll talk about it generally. But for those who just hear ARC, we want to summarize it in a very easy way for you to uh, understand it. Okay, having said that, let me go to the subject matter of the policy brief workshop uh, and uh, what are the objectives in terms of training. 
The first thing is that researchers always will package their work in terms of what they want to do. Some of them is a process of excellency. They want to make sure that they publish. And we push everyone to publish, and we give incentives for publication. But what we want to do to show and to want to show the policymakers is that we are, we, we, at the very end, we are actually developing research that is evidence-based, that is, it is going to inform policy. And it's going to be part of the policy output. And we want to uh, communicate those findings in a very te non-technical way to audience. And this is going to maximize the policy uptake and impact. You know, I've gone to, in my whole life, I, my colleagues are, my former colleagues are there. I told them that we don't retire ourselves, we change clients. You can see now you have, I'm facing another different type of clients. Most of the time, even policy makers themselves, they insisted on non-technical advice. I always said, yes, that's okay, but you also have to have a backing of that research to understand how it has been generated. Of course, we have colleagues that fear the technical aspects, so that's why I say, just provide something that is juicy, and then somebody can ask, how did you generate this outcome? How did you generate this conclusion? That would be a good policy person who actually understands, oh, I understand what you're telling me, but in my own private life or my own private time, let me understand how you generated those results. So it means that when it is non-technical, it means that it is also appearing. We want to create demand on the understanding of policy processes and even policy makers needs and even the role of policy briefs. This is something we have done for the last 34 years and I can tell you that most of the uptakes in terms of policy design in the African economies and even multilateral institutions taking up the kind of output we have is because of one, the relevance, two, trying to be an input to the process. And that is very, very important for us. And of course, using such non-technical inform in informative policy briefs, we make it a pivot in terms of communicating even to the social media and uh, how to communicate research to the social media in small, you know, I, I think they have small, short messages. You know, since uh, so many, uh, social media has developed so many platforms of communication. But you see, what they do is to give you some appetite in terms of what there is, and you go looking for results for yourself. And finally, we also want to make sure that you produce some policy briefs that not only from the ongoing research, but also gives you uh, 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 should I say a platform or even um, an, a, a, a starting point in terms of how you can develop policy research. I went through such myself many years back and I think since then I noticed that I can write a policy brief. What surprised me about AERC that particular time is that they also transformed or translated my policy brief into French. And so uh, I was trying to give it to a French person to read and it was reading very well. So the whole issue is that you have to get from your research idea into how do you communicate this. And this is what we are going to do in the, in the, in the next two, three days, and especially in the groups that you're going to be. Now, why we, um, does it? Sometimes it decides when to work or not to work, no? Okay. <laughs> Uh, I'm told that there are 39 researchers uh, from ongoing collaborative research projects. And there are three projects. But before I even go to those projects, most of you hear collaborative research projects in AERC. But you have to understand the process because a lot of work goes into it. We have three stages. Whenever we pick up a collaborative research project, we have three stages. And these stages are very, very critical because they actually define what we are going to do. One of the things is that the choice of a collaborative research project is actually based on the currency of the topic and even the importance of, po of the topic in terms of policy. That is how it is chosen. Second, we then look at if this is the topic, for example, we have chosen the topic on the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on livelihoods or even climate change or even financial inclusion, then we ask ourselves, who are the experts in this region? in this area. Once we define the experts, and then what are the main themes that we can actually develop? Then we get the themes. 
we have to look for the best, the best people who can deal with the subject matter all over the world because we want some, should I say, frontier knowledge. They are going to be found in Africa, but they are also going to be found in the rest of Africa or the, in the rest of the world. The biggest problem is that, in fact, some of the, our funders will ask us, how did you identify them? Most of the time we do a call, but you are familiar with the terrain yourselves. The best guys are not going to respond to a call, isn't it? So they, there has to be some prodding. We write to them and ask them, can you please help us read pro this project, coordinate this project? We at the Secretariat will do all the administrative work. So we will get the best. Once we get the best, they are going to develop, using the themes we have provided, they are going to provide or to develop the frontier or the framework papers. That is what the frontier knowledge is all about. Then after that stage of the framework papers, we are going to invite country case studies or case studies. And that for us is very important because the case studies will use the framework papers to be guided at the case studies. And the third stage is where we communicate to policymakers what we are telling the policymakers is that we have the frontier knowledge from the framework papers, we have evidence from the ca country case studies, and here we have repackaged evidence and even policy. We have designed policy, and we can even tell you about the, poli the, uh, the process of implementation. And we even go further at the ARC to ask the, policy, the senior policymakers to commit to the implementation process. That is why creating or developing policy briefs becomes very, very important because it is a, a product of the frontier knowledge, evidence from the case studies, and a summary of how this policy works, how it influences the, the public policy agenda, and how it can be redesigned for implementation. You have to understand that. Even though we are dealing with a sample of three projects here, ARC has so many projects, I think even now I we, we lose track, uh, Abebe, we lose track of the projects. I think we have like 16 projects the last time I counted. Diana, is that correct? Yeah? Yeah, we, we, we generate that because of the demand or the need that is required. We have to make sure that there are so many people working on this project as much as possible because of the policy design that is required. Right now, you can see the currency of the subject matter that is in front of you and you're going to be part of. The first one is the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on livelihoods in Africa. And I think so much, so much research has gone into this, but the most important thing is actually to spring from there and start asking what is the future post-COVID economic recovery strategy. So your policy design must be moving in that direction. Yes, we have understood the impact. What do we do? The second thing is, and this is something that we dealt with with Abebe, is what is the technology of managing pandemics? In fact, we were forced to go back into that by one of our funders, that is CEDA, Swedish CEDA, because we finished health financing in Africa and then we said, oh, but you're in the middle of the pandemic. You have to come back and deal with this because you have to learn how to manage pandemics in future because the moment you see one global pandemic, it means it has opened the door for others, isn't it? That's an example. But right now, we are dealing with the impact of the COVID on livelihoods in Africa. And you can be see this is one of the shocks that has even different dynam di di dynamics. So you're going to see different papers. And the trainers will actually give you a g some gist in terms of how we, 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 we package the policy briefs. The second one is financial inclusion in fragile and post-conflict estates in Africa. For those who know me, I've been dealing with financial inclusion for many years. We even started um, a network called Alliance for Financial Inclusion in 2009. We started it here in Nairobi to coordinate financial inclusion policies in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. It is still going strong every year since then. So we do know financial inclusion is very, very important. But what about those countries that are tagging behind? Fragile and post-conflict countries are where institutions are weak, or even when there is conflict, what you do is you first of all destroy the institutions, isn't it? So essentially, we don't want them to be left behind. That is why we are very specific. And we need to bring some policy lessons for those countries to adapt. And the, fun, the final one is climate change and economic development. Everybody is now talking about climate change. 
We talked about it many years back, but nobody seems to understand where it, we are going. Look at how even you can even talk about poverty, even conflict, ethnic conf conflict during drought, especially here in, North, uh, in uh, the Horn of Africa. So it means that it has very important aspects, but it has also given us some offshoots. And for us, for example, from my colleagues who have come from central banking, you know what it means to manage uh, short-term ma uh, monetary policy with uh, surprise-side shocks, and you only have demand-side demand instruments. And obviously, you know the repercussions. We already have a project that is going to start on uh, specifically as an offshoot from that. So that is, those are the three projects that you can see the breadth of, the, of, the, of those projects is how important they are. If they are that important, then it means that we have to be very, very exact and very persuasive in terms of policy briefs and even policy design that we are going to advise the governments in Africa. And that is why, for us, this is very, very important. We are also happy to see in person so that at least we want to make sure that we have a permanent impression and a permanent impact in you in terms of how to develop policy briefs. We have two trainers. Elder from Kipra, is he here? Oh, I have forgotten the faces. Yeah? Oh, okay. I'm looking the other way. Why did I? <laughs> I know you, but uh, you know I was in Kipra. I have gone to so many uh, places in my life. Thank you, Elder, for helping us and for agreeing to be a trainer in this. You are in uh, a very strong intersection between the policymakers and the researchers. So you know your experience is going to be very, very important because you are a national think tank. You, had a, you, you are in a nat national think tank and you know what is expected of you. So thank you very much and you'll be, the training uh, is going to work out very well because of experience. And the second one is uh, Joseph, Professor Joseph from the university. Yes, thank you very much, my friend, for many years. And um, University of Wits is one of our collaborating universities in our PhD program. And we have worked with them since 2003 when we started the PhD program. But most of the researchers have worked with us for a long time. The most important thing is to make sure that the, the two trainers, the, the first thing is understanding the subject matter because if you don't understand the subject matter, then you cannot actually develop a policy design, isn't it? But you understand the policy, uh, the, the subject matter because you are a researcher and you have researched in it. So you are the one who has researched in it. What they are going to do is to give you some pointers in terms of how you develop it. So thank you very much, uh, those trainers, for being with us. Anyway, I, don't, I didn't want my opening remarks to be a, a speech for the day. Let me try to move very fast. Let me say, it's good to mention a few pro uh, these projects in a, in a brief way. The impact of COVID-19 pandemic and rivalries in Africa is supported by IDRC. And we are working between, uh, with uh, Oxfam. And it's because Oxfam is good in terms of um, advocacy, and we are good at research. So essentially, you'll be giving Oxfam a very important input uh, on policy design, policy output and policy design, because they are going to be good advocates. We are not good at advocacy. We are good at designing policy. But we want to make sure that we want to inform policymakers and even de development practitioners on the impact of uh, COVID-19 and even the, uh, the, the, the gender dimensions. I've seen in our papers that violence increased, so many things. But you see, one of the things is about when you have a negative shock, there are people who actually are pushed to the periphery. And most of the time, there are people who have no means or even how to uh, revive or to revive the economic structure, and mostly women and even women-headed households. That's something that we can deal with. But we want to identify policy options for how we can actually develop equitable and sustainable uh, policy design and economic recovery strategy. Remember that is the goal, and let's, let's make sure that we don't lose sight of what is the goal that we want to advise. And once you identify the goal, you can actually provide evidence in terms of what you have found across countries in Africa. The second uh, um, policy, oh, oh, it's there. Uh, financial inclusion in fragile and post-conflict countries in Africa. And again, this is supported again by IDRC. And for us, it's very, very important to understand what is happening. What are the institutional makeups of uh, fragile and post-conflict economies? And I think that is our, sta our starting goal. 
And the first thing is to ask, what do we do? I remember one time I was actually trying to advise the CBS, the Central Bank of Somalia. And the first thing was actually even first of all to have a, an institution, or a, should I say a department that uh, regulates the financial market. And another department that regulates uh, even currency because you cannot have counterfeits and then you still believe that you can actually uh, control uh, money supply process. So many of those things. But the most important thing is that we want to move finance, financial inclusion has shown us that it is a good weapon for inclusive development. So you want to talk about Africa's inclusive growth and how the realization of the agenda of a particular uh, mission is going to be very, very important. We talk about vision and I always like to comment that the vision, like the vision 2030 in Kenya or even 2063 in uh, uh, AU uh, across so many countries is because it is a promise to give the private sector long-term periods of policy clarity. And that is very, very important. Vision is not a set of projects or programs. It's actually an agenda in terms of where we can go. And the, that, that's why when you talk about sustainable development programs and the vision, it's because we know that there will be long periods of uh, policy clarity. And then these are issues that we need to bring out. But for me, financial inclusion is also important in terms of reducing poverty sustainably. And we, can, we have seen in countries that it has succeeded uh, that uh, women are able to save and even invest in products, in financial products that cannot be encroached. And though for us, that is very, very important and it's something that you can pick up from there in terms of your policy design and even the direction that we are going. As we continue in terms of succeeding in financial inclusion, then we can consolidate our benefits and even uh, the developmental aspects of it. And that's why we are able to talk about even SDGs. Uh, finally, the, the final project, uh, you know, no, maybe it, it is refusing to go. It wants me to continue saying something about uh, uh, the subject matter. Climate change and uh, development in Africa. Again, this is a collaborative research project, generously funded by NORAD, Norwegian Development Agency, and it was designed to inform policymakers and development uh, practitioners on the opportunities and challenges of mitigating climate change and its consequences. And we, we, we don't seem to understand them. We only realize the precariousness when they have happened. Just look at the uh, Horn of Africa when we have devastated by uh, drought. Or just look at Madagascar when they have devastated, and Southern Africa, how they have been devastated by France, isn't, isn't it? It's almost the same level. You find a lot of uh, uh, human suffering. So, and we have also seen the links to poverty and uh, poverty and climate change, they are linked. Sustainability of even the environment itself. We have witnessed a thin, co a thin conference because of water resources in periods of drought. And we have also seen the effects of climate change on supply shocks that affects short-term macroeconomic management. So in, in, in a sense, you have everything that you can, you have actually the building pillars from what we observe, but you already have evidence that has, uh, research and evidence that has consolidated these issues. It is a question of how do we use now that evidence to actually communicate to the policymakers. So the same, again, it's a subject matter we can talk until cows come home, but for now, we want to make sure that we understand the subject matter and how we can repackage it for policymakers to understand, not only the implications, but the urgency of action. Are we together on that? Urgency of action, you know? Okay, because I want to make sure that the, the trainers take over from here I'm not one of the trainers. The, the only problem with me is that I've been on both ends as a researcher, as a trainer, and a policy maker. So I cut across. What are the components of the workshop? They have tutorials and exercises to improve the draft in terms of policy brief. One of the things I'm sure the trainers will do is to tell you, to te to t tell you please give us a summary of your, of your research proposal. We always told people to give summary, and then they start saying, uh, and then I regressed with the structure of R. Nobody wants to hear structure of, give me a brief. Oh, and we use GMM, please. <laughs> These are things that we, <laughs> we talk even in our dreams, but when we are telling the policy maker what we want, is that our empirical results or our analytical pro uh, results shows the following. So if you wanted to go back and find out, let me see how it was developed, then you can go and see how 
the structure of how I was working, the GMM, or any of those analytical ploys. But remember, we want to actually to show. You can summarize. I always told people that, I told my, my, my researchers and even my, uh, my trainees that if you don't get it in the first paragraph, you are not get it, going to get it in the 20 pages, isn't it? The first sentence tells it all. And you can always write an abstract. That is not more than 100 words, isn't it? So that is, and if somebody says, I need you to amplify how then I can implement, then you can go into the, the rest of the structure. We want the exercise in terms of how you, this exercise also to deal with how do you engage the media. And um, the social media is becoming very important because it can help you in terms of creating a platform for disseminating your work and creating an appetite to look for more, isn't it? So how do we do that? But also, we would like to get some feedback from you so that we can improve this engagement in future. We want to make sure that we only have three projects here, isn't it? And I've told you that we have, I, d I think I miscounted, maybe, maybe there are not 16 projects. They will all end up in having policy briefs. And those are the ones in the pipeline, but if I tell you the ones that are at the proposal development looking for funding, there are also more, okay? Okay, and there, for example, uh, um, Abebe, we want to design how we can actually develop uh, surprise side instruments to deal with the climate, uh, negative surprise side shocks for central bank. So we are calling it central banking and climate change. That is going to bring all the central bankers into the table, isn't it? So it means we have, we are also working on that. So every year we have new projects, but the most important thing is to get this feedback from you so that we want to perfect it. Over time we have perfected it, over time, there have been different topics and challenges. Policy challenges have been dealt with, but we want to go further. An example is that, for example, we AERC dealt with um, poverty reduction, growth, poverty, poverty, uh, poverty reduction, and inequality. And all of a sudden, it was picked up by the World Bank in terms of poverty reduction strategy papers. But the world now has changed. We have realized that, uh, especially last year, we now revisited the subject matter and talked about redistribution. We realized that actually we cannot talk about pro poor. It is not going to work. We can only talk about pro growth poverty reduction strategy because we have realized that strong growth can actually affect poverty, but it has to be supplemented by redistribution measures. COVID-19 showed us an example. For example, Abebe in Kenya in your paper, in Kenya it showed that the lockdown, when supplemented by targeted social transfers for the urban, it actually reduced the spread of COVID in a good percentage. But it's, if you compare it with Switzerland, it was Switzerland was of course more had, has more structure. But you can imagine in times of crisis, the government of Kenya and other African countries structured and developed social targeted social transfers. That's redistribution. We didn't talk about, we didn't want to talk about redistribution in that big way, welfare state, kind of, no. We wanted to show actually, in, you can actually threaten inequality and then support and sustain growth. Again, that's the currency. So it's also telling you what is also coming up in the next uh, training in terms of policy brief, because that is now going to shake our understanding of how you can deal with or sustain, uh, sustain the, uh, the growth process by poverty reduction. So we want your feedback, and that's going to be very, very important for us. And um, what is the expected output? Uh, output from this exercise? Policy briefs which are focused on the context and content of research, how the problem is defined, how the research, research results are communicated, and the implications for policymakers and how they can pick up and always make sure you know who is your target. So you can use the same policy brief and uh, actually present it to, to different uh, tag audience, isn't it? Because you always have to understand the audience. When I'm standing here, I'm talking to researchers, so I can go into that particular uh, quadrant very well because I know the target. So always know that at the end of the day, the target audience is very, very critical. And of course, we are going to have more policy engagement through the media. We have seen even in the Kenyan media, they are always calling us to, show, to ask us what is on the table, 
what is practical, what can we get from the table. And what they are doing is that if they get a policy brief, they actually, they are actually uh, producing it the way it is. Uh, but if it's technical, we have to again soften it for them. So it means that we would like to do that so that this is a ready material. If you go to our website, you can see that most, even the media can pull down what they want and even publish. Sometimes they want this collaboration, they want to ask us so that we give them what is, um, what is juicy for them at a particular time, and then they can use it. So I have used uh, many words, or I was supposed to open this forum, but uh, ha having to talk uh, to the researchers themselves is always good, and even having, sorry, oh yeah, and even having uh, this in-person meeting also creates another a demand or should I say incentive to talk more. But let me say that you have been chosen from a, a large number and because of the content of the subject matter of the three, three areas. But more importantly, even the trainers themselves have been chosen on the basis of that. But what we would like to make sure is that after these three se the sessions in the, the, uh, this week, we'd like to hear from you in terms of how you found the course useful in terms of the content, in terms of the training, in, some, in terms of the output. And we also want to learn from you other areas of improvement that we may want to work on. Even when you are working on this subject matter, you may also come up with an idea, how, did we, how can we extend even the research to other areas? You are also free to do that, and uh, we, we, we will be happy. So that we, at the end of the day, the course evaluation is also giving us some aspect of value added in terms of where we need to go. And that's for us is very, very important. We have covered on uh, the, the, the subject, the, the, the topics that I listed on the basis of the resources available, both in terms of finance and human capital. But at the end of the day, ideas do change over time just because of the information coming into the face. These days, we don't even have to go and pick up information. We are getting it from, uh, you know, you can get it, get the data. A big data kind of thing is coming up. So it is going to become very, very important. So it's something that we want to encourage you to let us have a feedback so that we can improve the process in, fu in future. And uh, if it responds, I am going to the final. These are not few remarks. Ideally, I wanted to start with a few, I wanted to make few remarks, but these are not few. Let me not cheat you. But what I would like to do is to make sure that you have a fruitful engagement. That's why I enlarged maybe the subject matter in terms of my commentary. And I hope uh, to read and appreciate the policy briefs that are going to be developed. Notice that we are also going to share them with the media. Notice that wherever you sit and wherever you go, you want to share it with your own respective country. And you want to make sure that they understand and even they use it. So it means that it's very, very important. And that is why ARC capacity building has been appreciated. And um, with those not very few words, let me declare this workshop officially opened. It is fine to have uh, engagement. I'm sure we are going to, uh, to get demands for more. But more importantly, let's make sure that it is value adding and it is incisive. Don't forget also, it is a combination of in-person and link. So you need also to make sure that you get to tell those people who are uh, on virtual that this is the process and they have to be engaged. Let them not go away. They, they should keep their videos open if when they are talking, if it's possible. But of course, we have challenges in bad with wherever we go. So from, the, from our side, from East African side, let me say, Asante Sana. And uh, good morning, enjoy the workshop. Let us hope that it's going to make the value that we intended. Thank you very much and good, uh, good morning. I believe uh, you can see the passion in the way he presented this opportunity for uh, uh, all participants. Uh, it's a bit of also, you see, the experience that comes with it. Uh, he mentioned he's been a researcher, a trainer, a policy maker. Uh, so now he's a capacity building, agent of capacity building, as I am as well. 
so in the next program, I think uh, we'll have a few words from our uh, mentors or resource persons. We have different names for them. Um, but they, they will definitely learn from you and you learn from them. Uh, maybe uh, uh, from my own experience, if I just uh, uh, tell you about policy briefs, uh, I've been around also in the business a bit, uh, UNECA, World Bank, African Development Bank. Uh, so uh, some of you in the central bank also recognize uh, you are always asked, okay, what is the impact of this uh, shock on our economy? And we need it uh, by tomorrow's EOB. So you have to write a policy brief to the decision makers. Uh, and it's not always easy how to pick it. But my experience is that you can also reverse from policy briefs to research. Usually now, today, we have started to look at developing policy briefs from the work we have done. I can tell you also from policy briefs, you can develop very good research ideas and then pursue them uh, and get them uh, somewhere that benefits uh, humanity. So without uh, really taking too much of your time, let me invite uh, uh, our resource person, Edlan. I know you have the whole day, but we can keep it in terms of timing. So uh, any intervention followed by Prof. Joseph. Both of you, warm welcome and uh, please. As Charles sets the PowerPoint, I want to indicate to us that we are going to be a team of um, trainers, and um, I'll pick it from where the executive director has uh, left it. This work is going to focus on communicating policy research. And in the space of uh, research, there are many questions we ask. So as we have the PowerPoint on, we start with the levels and the phases of communicating research. If I can ask us, what is the value chain? of research because research is a product, it's an investment, and also it has value. So as stakeholders in the policy uh, research and also academic research arena, I'll ask us at what level are we? If we look at the research papers that now we already have, we are at the production stage. In the production stage, it's a process of analyzing. We've analyzed our work. We are now moving to communication. And in communication, we are asking a number of questions. What are we communicating? Where? When, who, and how are we doing this communication? And that's why the ultimate aim is to create impact and to create change. Change goes all the way up to project design. We also go back to see how to reuse the data and the information we are already communicating we also have to look at the ultimate outcome. Because as the executive director has said, we have invested a lot of resources in research. But now this research, how does it improve our livelihoods? 
How does it eradicate poverty? How does it enable our societies to be resilient from the effects of COVID, effects of climate change? So with that in mind, then, as we'll be moving on with this um, uh, three days training, we are looking at how do we distill scientific evidence to communicate to the policy makers, to communicate to the citizens, because in research, the ultimate target should be the beneficiary. So if we are talking of the beneficiary, this beneficiary can be dynamic, it can be very uh, heterogeneous, that's very different from another person. So at some point when communicating, and we'll see that from the social media, that you can go deeper into even local language in communicating, and that's why we are here. So we'll be looking at the non-academic audience and going deeper to also make sure that even the evidence we are giving is reliable, it is credible, and also using the various uh, channels that are there. Uh, one channel which we'll maybe explore as we continue is using the digital assets. We all know that COVID has disrupted everything, and with the digital economy, many things can happen at the same time. So we are going to have a very engaging uh, session as we'll be progressing to make sure that as we look at the assets that have already been developed, and even as we move to the 5G, more assets are coming up. So as scientists in research and in the social uh, sector for that matter, then we need to look at uh, how do we uh, use the many assets that are coming up in the digital space and also in the communication stage. We also uh, ask ourselves in the policy arena and also in the research arena, what is the link between science and communication? Science, all of us in the room are maybe social scientists, but when communicating to the public, the public which is very dynamic, which is not homogeneous, then you really have to understand the point of linking between what the evidence tells us and also what knowledge we have generated to what the public requires. And here the public can imply the various types of audience that we are going to consider throughout the week. The audience can be a high level policymaker. For instance, it can be the president. If it's the head of state, you will only have maybe two minutes for the type of work you've done for a whole year. So we'll be asking ourselves, how do we communicate this work to the level that the head of state can be able to get the message he wants and make a decision at that point in time? Another audience is Mwanainchi, that is the citizen. Now, the citizen is maybe wondering why is the price of food increasing because we've had the major shock of COVID, or it could be due to climate change. So this particular audience does not understand the jargon we use to create evidence he or she does not understand the process that you've gone through. What he or she wants to hear is, am I able to feed my children? So in that case, if you are the one making the policy brief or communicating, then you have to take that into account. Another area which 
we have to consider is innovation. Things are changing. For instance, uh, we have very little paper in front of us. So we'll be asking ourselves as we use the digital spaces, what other products can we also produce even as we produce the work we already have? The other area then, as I conclude, is why this training? The first reason is to meet the non-academic audience. As we create impact, we also want to expose all of us to emerging digital communication assets. We'll try to see how to use the various digital platforms. And in that process, when we come up with the uh, improved policy briefs, we'll also go deeper to see how do you make it much simple for even coming up with blogs, coming up with um, uh, pictorial messages, which anyone can relate with when doing um, any policy recommendation. And also, if uh, time allows, we'll look at the issues of um, even media articles, because uh, day in, day out, we even now have digital media and development of content. So you'll be able to uh, go through the entire process and see how to even reuse the information that you already have. And with that, I request um, us, as we progress uh, with the training, we are going to remove our research hats and put on the communication hats. Thank you. Good morning. Yes, um, I want to thank the African Economic Research Consortium Executive Director and the management for the opportunity given me to be one of the two lead trainer for uh, this policy brief training workshop. I'm very grateful for that. And um, I'm going to follow up with what uh, the presentation of the uh, one of the, the previous lead trainer and um, we'll be just highlighting our expectation from um, from the workshop. Basically, I trust that we're going to have um, a very insightful uh, training that at the end of the training, uh, each uh, participant will be able to distill their research uh, into proper, uh, okay. Great. We'll be able to distill uh, their research into proper policy brief that policymakers can actually adopt. Um, I'm coming from a um, practitioner scholar point of view, and um, I'm going to share some remarks and, uh, about experience, uh, principally uh, why policymakers don't most of the time uh, adopt uh, evidence from a um, policy brief. And um, this is coming from a practitioner point of view. Uh, first of all, as an academician and as someone who is also who has always been in the policy space, uh, uh, having worked with two United Nations uh, organizations, the United Nations Office of Project Services and the United Nations Technology Innovation Labs program. And also, I understand what operates and how policy briefs have been treated. And I'm also uh, at the ECOWAS level, a regional development finance institution, and um, at the Office of Vice Presidents and Advisor. We have many of these uh, research policy briefs and why they are not actually being taken into consideration. And um, the fact remains that many studies have suggested that policymakers are more inclined to, to consider evidence during decision making, especially if it is presented in the form of a summary of highlights and the policy brief is seen as relevant uh, means of transferring knowledge that fulfills the need to receive such information in a condensed form. 
At the same time, despite the popularity of policy briefs, research and studies have also examined, uh, several studies have examined the effectiveness of policy brief and the influence of the policy brief uh, on policy makers, but many times the connection, uh, there's a disconnection between adoption of such policy briefs. And um, in the course of this training, we'll be looking at why is this disconnection and what is the gap? And we expect that this training will help us to close the gap. And um, if policy makers are inclined to accept the evidence from policy briefs and on the other side they are not adopting it, what is the gap? What is the disconnect? And then uh, we trust that um, this training will provide us with the opportunity to be able to see these gaps and fill them in the course of the three days uh, meeting. Uh, the lack of knowledge about the workings of politics among researchers and conversely, the lack of skill in searching for and understanding scientific literature and policy, that's one of the major issues. Uh, several researchers do not understand how the policy space work. And uh, many times I would think that it would be a good experience for researchers to actually have some kind of experience in a policy institution to actually understand how policymaker thinks. And um, at the same time, it's also good for policymakers to also have, on the other side, conversely, um, experience in research and um, so that they can harmonize the two expectations together. That's why I shared earlier that I've been in academia and I've been in policy space at a regional uh, uh, economic community level and also at United Nations uh, level. So I understand how they think, and you'll also be hearing from my boss when he'll be presenting, Mauricio Gazzola, um, about the expectation of uh, policymakers in the, in the United Nations uh, organizations. The tendency among policymakers for various reasons, number one, they don't have time, lack of time, political influence, and complexity. You can imagine vice president of an institution in a policymaking institution, most of the time do not have time to read policy briefs. A lot of time they depend on their advisors to read for them and share with them in five minutes when they're about to take decisions. So we need to understand this, and that is also, we also need to reduce the complexity and um, ignore certain conditions of an issue and solutions, rely more on the beliefs and values of the facts. So it's also very important for us to understand that the length of research reports and systematic reviews, conflicting results, and lack of time for critically reviewing all the available evidence. Many times, research reports are often lengthy. Several systematic reviews are very complicated because of the jargons, the languages that are being used. Most policymakers do not understand. Many of the terms we use, computational general equilibrium, you talk about your econometric modeling, they don't understand that. They want something very brief to the point they don't even have time to read it. They don't even read them. They depend on their advisors to read them. And Another issue why policy briefs have been seen to be ineffective and where there is a disconnect between what the expectation of policymakers are and what the expectation of researchers are is that the generally short time frame in which decision is about to be made. Look at the case of COVID. The UN has lots of funding on COVID. So much funding is pushed out to do research and you must take decision within a short time frame COVID is not waiting for us to develop complicated research techniques, methodologies, so the time is very short. And relatively long time frame required to generate research reports or synthetize, synthesize evidence. Many times it takes six, seven months to be able to collect your data, analyze them, distill them, and provide this policy brief. But decisions have to be taken within a space of one month. How do we harmonize this? Another one, difficulty of operating well-established practices and less political receptivity to new solutions. Most policymakers have an idea of what they want to do. They do not understand the innovation space. You know, they don't understand the innovation space. They have an idea of what they want, what they want to do. They don't have time to read these documents and they have to take prompt decision. So which caused the results of convincing research to take years to percolate. Many times it takes them lots of years. Even in most of these policy making institutions, that has Department of uh, Research and Strategic Planning. For example, most institutions are having this now at the United Nations level. 
at um, uh, African Union level, at the regional economic community that have in the Department of Research and Strategic Planning. But many times, even when these policy briefs uh, uh, distill to them, it takes them lots of time to percolate and to understand. How do we make it simpler for them to understand? How do we develop briefs that are just one page, that are sharp, pointing, that can pick immediately and actually use? These are part of the things we'll be looking at in the course of these three days, looking at this gap. That's what we're focusing in. And at the end of the three days, we also expect that each participant will be able to have work with you on uh, several exercises and be able to look at your research report, look at the various structural frames that we'll be looking at in the policy brief uh, documentation, the, 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 the highlights, the topic, looking at um, the executive summary, the policy angle, policy recommendations, and each of the days we'll be working with you on each uh, of your research papers, looking at how we can gather you know, in groups and be able to actually work together on each element of these structural frames each day at the end of the three days so that we can have a comprehensive policy brief that we can actually utilize. Finally, I think this will be the last point. Any knowledge transfer strategy, we need to have a knowledge transfer strategy, a strategy to be more effective, must involve users of the knowledge and the policy brief together, in no exception. There has to be a synergy between uh, the researchers and also between the policymakers. They have to be on the same space. That's why I've earlier mentioned that it is very important to have us as researchers. Maybe you can have, I, I understand that African Economic Research Consortium do have this visiting scholars program, which to me is very fantastic, where you can have opportunity to be connected to several policy institutions at IMF, at the World Bank, at several places. Of course, we can also come to the United Nations or regional economic community to actually understand how policymakers think so that that helps you, there's a connection. For example, uh, uh, some of my students, when I was a visiting professor at the Pan-African University that's um, in Clemson in Nigeria, many of my students became very mandatory now that when you do your master's program, we attach them to Islamic Development Bank and they must distill their research paper into a policy brief. It's a mandatory requirement for internship and visiting scholars program with the Islamic Development Bank. So that has actually helped to adopt their work. So the formulation of policy brief possess challenges for the uptake of the evidence by policymakers. That's also something that is very critical. Most of the time the vocabulary that we use and the formulations of the ideas need to be in very simple language. Many of these policymakers, some of them are not economist. In fact, it will interest you that many times you see vice president of institution, they are not economists. Some are even lawyers. <laughs> Some are even lawyers. They don't understand what you're talking about. Many times uh, they have advisors who read these documents and explain to them what it is. I've had to do that many times. <laughs> for my boss, I have to read it and distill it. And when you are briefing them, there are five minutes for you to brief. And they are taking very critical decision. For example, about 15 countries in the Aquas region and a particular decision. And they only give you five minutes to debrief. And then they have to go right away, go to heads of state meetings and take decisions. I got five minutes to do that. So the languages that we use must be very simple and they're not the kind of complex one we use. And uh, I know we can run several models. Uh, so we must understand we can do econometric modeling. We can do this, we can do that. So it has to be simple and um, formulate specific recommendations based on concrete facts. And also, I need to mention that we must, we must abstain from extrapolating. Many times we do a lot of backcasting and forecasting, and then policymakers don't understand that. They want to have concrete facts. You interpolate, you, you use your SPSS, what kind of thing you use, a structural equation, modeling in a model, so what kinds of things, but they don't understand your extrapolation. They want to see concrete facts, what has worked and what is working now. So that is the kind of thing they're looking for. Thank you very much. I think I will stop at it. Thank you very much. I think the next program we have is a um, workshop introduction 
workshop objectives and training deliverables by Prof. Abebe. Yeah, that was how that. Director of Research at ARC. Okay, 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 please. Okay, thank you. So the next uh, program is, um, we've put this program in place uh, that we believe will enrich participants, which is policy makers, advisors, opening remarks. And then um, we are having uh, Maurizio Gazzola, who is um, the global head of the United Nations Technology Innovation Labs Program, and also the chief policy strategic solutions and governance at the United Nations office in Vienna, in Austria. Uh, he was supposed to connect virtually, but uh, he has an ad hoc meeting. He's traveling right now from Australia back to Vienna. And um, because of COVID, several things changed in his flight. So he will, he has done a pre-recorded uh, opening remarks, which um, our IT uh, platform will share for us to listen to uh, his experience with um, policy making and what is the expectation in the United Nations Global Office, especially in the Technology Innovation Labs program. Uh, what is expectation? He has managed this uh, space for 23 years and, um, and he has quite lots of experience. Please, IT. My name is Maurizio Gazzola. I'm working for the United Nations, and uh, thanks a lot for the invitation today at the African Economic Research Consortium and your uh, policy brief training workshop you're going to be holding today. Um, I just want to be very brief, and I will give you a few ideas from my point of view and my perspective. Uh, I've been working in uh, ICT and information communication technologies for, for many years and I've been struggling with the, the pace of the need for decision to be made uh, at, and the time that uh, research and uh, policy making uh, is, is taking. So there's a big um, um, disconnect here and I, I trust that uh, today uh, the, in the workshop you will talk about ways of um, uh, and factors responsible for the underuse of evidence by policymakers, because this is really what is the problem that we are facing. Also, from coming from a United Nations information communication technology uh, perspective, in terms of implementing systems and solution to address uh, policy requirements. So I, I will just talk you through a few briefing points and uh, um, about. The factors that most frequently are identified as responsible for underuse of evidence by policymakers are basically the discrepancy between the generally short time frame in which a decision need, need to be made, this window of opportunity that is very always very short, and the relatively relatively long time frame required to generate research result or synthesize evidence for policymaker decisions. And uh, the lack, of, the second point obviously is the lack of knowledge about the working of uh, the politics among the researcher. And on the other side of the, of, the, of the coin, the lack of skill in researching for and understanding scientific literature from in, in policy makers. So there is a disconnect here that we need to bridge. And obviously the length of the research reports and the systematic reviews and the conflicting results and lack of time of critically reviewing all the available evidence is also really a factor that hinder um, you know, the adoption and the connection between policy making and research. Another big uh, uh, item is really the absence of usually contextualized evidence from local studies. So the, the, a place where to go and find this contextualized evidence. Um, another area is the difficulty of uprooting well-established practices and less political receptivity to new solution, which uh, causes the result of convincing research to take years to really go through and, and um, percolate uh, between quotes through the uh, policymaker decision-making uh, process. Um, and, and the last thing that I would just um, uh, highlight is the tendency among policymakers for various reasons, and sometimes it's lack of time and political influence and the complexity of the matters is really to try to take shortcuts and reduce 
the, the, the complexity by ignoring certain dimensions of an issue or a solution, and really to rely uh, as much as on their belief and values instead of you know, on facts and evidence-based uh, uh, research. So these are actually the, the few points that I wanted to, to, to bring up as a key factor of this disconnect. But how do we success in maximizing the impact of policy briefs? Um, you know, the, the, I think the one of the key issues is really the policy brief need to be focused. All aspects of the policy brief, from the messages, from the layout, need to be strategically focused on achieving the intended goals and or convincing the target audience. Also in this era of social media and, and, and fast access to the information, uh, you know, there's really little time and, and, uh, and uh, appetite to, to read uh, you know, lengthy reports. So also we really need to be, you know, the policy brief, policy brief need to be professional and, and, and as less, less academic as possible because the audience of the policy brief is not really interested into the research and analysis procedures conducted to produce the evidence, but are very much interested in to know the writer perspective on the problem and the potential solution based on the new evidence. And also, um, you know, it's, it's uh, obvious, but it has to be, all the policy brief has to be evidence-based because whenever you have um, a, a policy brief is a communication tool. So you need to uh, produce this for pot potential audiences, not only to, uh, expecting a rational argument, but only need to be convinced by uh, of argumentation supported by evidence that a problem exists, the consequences of adoption of particular alternatives are uh, available. And again, bringing back into the, uh, the, the discussion of the fast pace of, uh, of information uh, sharing and social media impact on this is really the idea to con con concentrate on very quick, easy, easy read type of uh, documents that can be um, easily digested by policymakers to make their own decision. I would, as I said, I will be very brief and uh, I will let you discuss these topics in more details and learn more into today's and tomorrow's workshop. So thanks for, for your attention and um, good, good, good wishes for today. Thank you. Great thanks to Mauricio Gazzola that has accepted his um, invitation despite the very short notice. Thank you very much. Uh, the next, um, uh, policy maker that will be making uh, a remark uh, is um, Dr. Fola Ayonide. Interestingly, he's been a member of the African Economic Research Consortium many, many years ago when at the early stage, uh, who's a PhD from the Nigeria Premier University of Ibadan, had been in the policy space, had been in academia, had been with the Nigerian National uh, Economic Management Agency, has worked with the United Nations International Labor Organization, and um, has also worked with the African Capacity Building Fund, uh, I think in, um, in Zimbabwe, and also as the regional director for Western and Central Africa in Ghana. Currently, he's based in Songdo in South Korea uh, at the Green Climate Fund, and then that's the largest global climate finance architecture in the world with a portfolio of 11 billion. I'm sure participants uh, in the climate change and economic development will find the presentation of Dr. Shola uh, Fola Ayurede extremely insightful. He has all the experiences, practitioner scholar, covering many years close to over 30 years. Thank you, Dr. Fola, for accepting to be part of this uh, meeting, despite the short notice. Thank you. Please, Ion. Thank you, uh, Professor Adelago. Well, I just want to be straightforward by being very informal. Joseph is a very personal friend of mine, and um, we've been together for several years. At this point, as he has introduced to me, I want to say again that I'm very privileged and honored to be part of this um, training program. Like he mentioned, I have been a beneficiary of the ALC grant, as well as also been a practical of the training workshops such as this one that um, we are having at this time of the year. And um, I'm honored to be able to share my experiences a little bit on the, um, the focus of um, the training, which is on policy brief. 
Um, can we go to the presentation? The title of my presentation this morning is um, the role of policy, the role of policy based on in communicating research on climate change. And the content of my presentation this morning is first to define, I've listened to the introduction and also those who have come up and I think that you might think that we are actually stealing from one another. And um, why should we communicate climate change to our policymakers? What do we need to communicate? And what should be the structure of a policy brief? And if at the end there are any questions, I will be there to um, listen to you, to, 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 to hear the questions and provide um, answers if I'm able. On the next slide, um, is the presentation online? So the first I thought would be good for us is to know what actually do we mean by policy brief. And um, I, in my um, this definition, indicated that a policy brief should be a concise summary of a particular issue or topic that is used by researchers to succinctly deliver their message to policy professionals and decision makers in a very accessible format. And the focus should be that you want to convey research findings or in fact in a policy context, the earlier um, lady, um, I think it's Dr. Elder, who has who gave us uh, you know, so a little bit of introduction on what it should be. It should be able to, uh, researchers should be able to showcase stories or issues that could be very difficult for policymakers like Professor Adilegon has mentioned, who don't have the time to read through the whole gamut of a research document. And you know, relating it to uh, the audience social context. And it should also include the key summaries or recommendations that is going the, the researcher is trying to pass across. Also non-expert readers should be able to readily understand the key policy messages and the main findings that is coming out from that particular uh, policy brief. So now that I've just tried to do a little bit of um, a definition, why or how does this relate to um, climate change? I don't know whether the presentation is online, but I think it will be shared with you later. So why do we communicate climate change research to our policymakers? The first is that we need a policy, we need policies on climate change that has solid scientific foundation and if you have been looking at the trend of things that has been happening for the past five years, you know that it is very important more now than ever. Also, I has as earlier mentioned, it is to be able to increase the accessibility of so many researches that has been ongoing for several years, like the IPCC um, documents, to be able to do the relevant work that pertains to policy and Policy briefs is the next slide, please. Will also empower policymakers with the information that they need to design, like Professor Ademidon mentioned, at the split decision making power, they will be they require the information at the, at their fingertips that will enable them to be able to design and implement more effective policies. Also, it is to improve to to improve strong and effective collaboration between researchers and the policy makers. At this point, it is that it is very essential that policy decisions which directly impact society and the well-being are based on solid scientific evidence. And as such, there is a need for a, a strong relationship between the researchers and the policy professionals in order to be able to bring forward real-world impacts and ensuring that the communication between the researchers and policymakers remain very um, you know, um, cordial. Also, it is to reduce the barrier for time poor policy professionals, like um, Professor Padilegon had mentioned, 
they don't have the time to listen to three hours like the workshop that you're having now they just don't have that time and so it is what we call real-time evidence that they can use to be able to make the decision and finally to be able to have a transparent relationship of what is happening at the, in the academia and what is happening in the real world of bringing the information of research to bear in real world experiences so what are we communicating at first glance one will assume that climate change communication is ab just about education and informing people about this massive issue if you look at Greta Thunberg for example she tells you just look at the facts what is the world talking about she will tell you that we need such information in order to be able to mobilize and to solve this climate crisis however on a deeper level we know that climate change communication also is sh shaped by a different experiences what is happening in africa for example is quite different from what is happening in the caribbean we have deforestation in africa and yet in the caribbean we have the hurricanes we have the flooding massive flooding and when they come it's the effects are vastly different from so to be able to bring such experiences is very important as well as the perspective the mental and the cultural models that are in different worlds what is happening for example in eastern europe with the, with the ukrainian war and also how the effect on, on 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 the climate in that area is quite different from some of the you know conflicts and wars that we also have in africa they have different dimensions and they are different values as well as world views of how it is going to be projected so we need to be able to balance what is seen the, at the surface level and the root cause of some of these issues. So now that we are talked about what should we be communicating is the challenge of climate change, the high salience but low engagement. So, and I think um, Dr. Elder also referred to it that what are the sort of things that we need to be able to see when in, in terms of what we want to communicate and the first is the effect of climate change that is if you look at some of the pictures that are there we see um, the effect of um coaching we now we've just finished winter here you'll be very surprised that within one week the sun and the the the, the summer period the the the, the 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 heat is now so much you wouldn't believe that it is barely a crossover between two weeks you will still have expected that it is still going to be a little bit cold but now the heat is much everybody have already started to use ac so what are the effects of climate change that we want to pass across people's lives will inevitably change as a result of climate change and how to respond to its impact and the need for us to be able to dramatically reduce the carbon emissions we want to reduce the green gas emissions we want to see how can we adapt how can we mitigate on some of the effects of the changes that we've seen through deforestation, drought, flooding, and whatnot. Also, part of the things that we want to communicate is the impact in order that if we are experiencing such things, what needs to change in terms of our behavior, what practices, and level of consumption. I loved it when Dr. Professor Adelegon mentioned COVID. COVID is a very apt example of what has happened with the changes with the, we, we moved over to flexible working and, and you know environments for example it became hybrid and many could not travel anymore so also with um, the changes for example when we have hurricanes in in caribbean many have to be moved to shelters many have to change they have to adapt their houses and schools for example to ensure that when such things come they are able to withstand the impact of such you know when the natural disasters and weather change and that the next focus is now on the required policy change we don't just look at the effects and sit still and say nothing is going to happen but in fact if you look at the data that is given for example in the uk there was a survey that was undertaken in 2019 and there more than 67 percent of the people said in the past three years climate change has become a very topical issue for them but about 40 percent of them said they don't think anything is going to be done about it 
So if we are part of that group that is saying nothing is going to be done, this is where research comes in. And with the evidence that research will generate, it will help us to be able to indicate the need for policy among our, our, our politicians. And you said, I've given you an example that as seen during the COVID pandemic, choices people make will be guided by government regulations, social practices, individual decisions, all of which will be shaped by the availability of information and the way in which it is communicated. How do we tailor communication? And this is presenting its case for policy briefs. Professor Adelegon also, again, in, during the course of his presentation, has tried to show the mix and the connection between scientists, the policymakers, and practitioners. And he gave a wonderful example of what travel, whether at the ECOWAS region or at the African Development Bank, he showed that there's a need to be able to construct a storyline, a narrative that will be able to bring these three group of people together. And in the midst of this connection is the one that is based on compre the storyline that you want to showcase that is based on comprehensive, who produced evidence base. The space for policy briefs is science informs climate change action and practice on the ground. However, the disconnect between science and practice means that barriers to in that progress based on up-to-date evidence. If you don't have up-to-date evidence, things are changing. The, the level that they had expected that climate change is supposed to be mitigated has changed about 20 years ago compared to what we have today. And so policy briefs help bridge the gap between policymakers, scientists, and practitioners. It also helps frame complex, challenging societal issues such as climate change in a way that aligns and resonates with people's values and builds on what climate change impact and solution means to them. So it's one thing to sit on the fence, but with the evidence that is going to be provided with, um, with, um, uh, with a policy brief or, or with the research, it makes it easy for people to be able to accommodate the information that is being passed across to them. There are also useful ways of enhancing local knowledge, understanding and engagement with climate change and it can enable a better connection. What we see with the work that we do at um, like doing climate change is that we now have regional projects or programs that are coming with about three or four countries that are experiencing similar things. And with that, they, they provide what are the barriers that they are experiencing and what it is that they would like to change in maybe in terms of mitigation or adaptation and to be able to have access to such funds. So, as I'm wrapping up on my presentation, which is just an opening remark to set the tone for the next two days that you will be having um, discussions among yourselves and, you know, doing practical work on how to put such your, your, your research work into, uh, condense it into a policy brief. I just thought that I should also, add, you know, wrap up with this presentation is that when we are doing this, policy briefs should not be more than 1.5 page max. Um, the, my, the previous speaker indicated that we need something very succinct and that will, you know, that will be of interest, that, are, that can catch, easily catch the attention of the policymakers. So it shouldn't be more than, at most, even one, two pages might be extremely too long. And it should be with a highly structured template, with a text box, box with a bullet point of key messages for policy. You should... In that document, it should have a summary of the problem, the findings, and the study design, as well as include the session for um, suggestions for further reason. Why we have mentioned this is that the, the structure allows policy professionals to quickly figure out whether the research is relevant to their work and the takeaway messages. And there should be very clear distinctions between the policy brief as well as the the article and any other article types that are all over the all over the place. Please note that policy briefs should be linked to research papers that have been published. They should be written by the authors of the source paper. And lastly, all information included in the policy brief must be present in the original paper to ensure that it has already undertaken it has undergone peer review. So I would like to stop here.
and if there are any questions. So, We are very grateful to the two uh, wonderful presentations. I think they are the prelude to what you will be discussing. We will be discussing in the next three years. We appreciate their intervention. Uh, so basically they bring the wealth of experience uh, from their uh, workstation how a policy brief uh, now should look like. I think you have already a fair idea, but I can Hello? tell you. Hello? Yes, yes, we can Hello. hear you. Yes. Uh, okay, so. Um, I, I think I'm struggling to find the uh, raise your hand function. I, I wanted to ask a question, uh, Dr. Abebe. Uh, you said you have a question? Hello. Uh, so, uh, okay, our colleagues will help us coordinate the. Um, I think from attendees uh, in the virtual space want to ask question. Go ahead, please. Okay, so colleagues coordinating this uh, hybrid. Anyway, I think uh, let's proceed. Um, uh, we okay? Joel? Yeah, okay. So uh, now we will be, uh, the next session uh, is uh, coffee for you. Uh, Sorry? You want you want to ask questions? Yes. Yeah, please. I think there are a few questions. There are participants who might want to ask questions. But I don't know if she is still online. I wish to ask. She noted that he, if you are writing a policy brief, you must be the author of the paper. But if you come across a, a paper, maybe you are in a space thinking policy and you know they're struggling with knowledge gap and you know that someone has already done that work and that work is already published in the public space yeah. what are the risks of you using that paper with of course due citation and translating it into a sharp policy brief uh, uh, will, will your commandment be, be broken thanks okay so so uh, is can we see if she's online? Okay, I think the question addressed is basically, yes, she mentioned, she gave us a little bit of a guide on how to produce a policy brief. I don't think she meant this is always it has to be, at, at least on her behalf. Uh, it's good if you are, the, you see, when you are producing a policy brief out of your research paper, that is something else. But suppose, for instance, your boss asks you, what is the impact of COVID on my country? You don't need to write, you, you don't need to have written the paper. You look for other papers that have already been done, and then you explore the potential impact using whatever data also you have at hand. Uh, so anyway, this is something you are going to discuss Ah, okay, so, why, uh, uh, okay, le le let's give her a chance to respond, yeah. Uh, Dr. Son. Okay, please go ahead. Uh, the question is, uh, should always you be the author of uh, a research paper to produce a brief?
I don't know whether you can hear me, but um, I can't hear any. We can hear you. The uh, there was a question for you. Can you hear us? Uh, hello? Actually, we can hear you, but uh, so far, since the director started talking, I've not heard anything to. Can you hear us from this side? We can hear you from yours. Okay, I can hear you now. So I didn't hear the question. No, no, there was one question. Can you hear me now? Uh, let me rephrase it for you. Uh, the question was simply, you mentioned in your presentation that ideally a policy brief should be written by the same people who have produced the research paper. Uh, they just want you to comment on that. Yeah, because um, when we call it a policy brief, it is the work of a researcher. It's an extraction of information from a research that has been done or undertaken by the person or the group of the researchers and so they can extract that information. But there are occasionally where if you are working with an organization and an organization can ask that there's been a research that has been conducted maybe on a particular sector, maybe it's an infrastructure sector, for example, and the government wants to take a policy decision. If you are in such an organization, maybe like a research organization or a consulting organization, the, the, your, the management can ask somebody working in that organization to quickly take a research document and extract some form of policy brief. I know that I do recollect that when I was working in the government parastata in Nigeria, we had to do that several times, especially where the government is willing, is ready to undertake a policy decision and they require some, you know, some form of information that can come, that is extracted from evidences based on research. So that can happen, but the general tone is you want, you have done a, a, a book, you want some extracting of policy, you think it's quite topical and requires some form of policy decision to be taken on it. Most often it has to be the work of the, that policy brief you need to be extracting. And I believe that is the focus why we are having this training decision, this, this, this training now for how you can extract, you know, a policy, how you can develop a policy brief from the research that you have undertaken. Also, I see on the comment side about why should ADB have more than five pages. Now, what you have done as a, a researcher, which you want to put, which is why I said for a structure, it shouldn't be more than 1.5. But when an organization like a multilateral development bank like ADB or World Bank, you know, they have lots of information that has been done by different researchers. And if you look at their annual reports, for example, which can take more than 200 pages, for them to be able to condense a 200 page document into a policy that is going to scan across several countries on a continent, they need to be able to beef it up a little bit more than what an individual um, researcher is going to do. And so that is why you might find ADB or other um, um, institutions, financial institutions, having more than a two pager or but having up to five pages because then it speaks to several aspects and different contexts of what has been done by by different researchers. Thank you so much. Uh, anybody here who wants, uh, uh, we are also running over our time. Uh, could you come please to ask your question? Doctor, thank you so much for the insightful presentation. I particularly love the aspect where you stated that we might need to 
put our key policy messages in bullet points. I think that's very important and could be cashy. But I just need a clarification on the statement you made that um, our policy brief should be linked to a published work, a published you know, paper or research. Can we, uh, like we are here now, our work is not yet published, but we want to, or, or maybe you've been able to come up with a very robust report. You know, you have done your analysis, do your findings and everything. Can you get your policy from such documents? I mean documents that have not been published, although it's at a state of being published, but not published yet. So I just need a clarification on that. Thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, thank anybody you. else uh, from the virtual space who want to ask questions uh, to the presenter so she can uh, respond and we finalize? Yeah, come here, please. I want I wish to thank you for the presentation. My question is uh, for us uh, academicians, we don't write without citing. So, uh, how many references do you advise that we put in the policy brief, considering the five pages? Okay. Let me, let me quickly answer. Okay, so uh, you, you, you can you can uh, respond uh, very quickly. So we. Uh, wrap up this session. Okay, thanks. Okay, to respond to the last question, if if you'd like a one pager or if one point five page or two page, you know that you can't write too many, but you can have an annex where which I had ex explained that you can have for suggested readings, the ones that are quite cogent that might give more information is what you provide, and like we always mention. Policy makers don't have time to read, you know, such torrent and big documents. So if you have other notes that are not that heavy in tone or in the jargons that will be very easy for them to understand, then you can list maybe three or four of such in that document. But if you, because if you are working with the AFDB, they will always have a whole list of documentations that has been prepared specifically, maybe country by country, that will help them to under, understand the context by a country and you know perspective. And to respond to the other question, which says that does it have to be published work? Usually, you know, this that is why we said it must be something that has been evidence that has undergone peer review. That is other people can attest to the information that is coming there. And why we are indicating that it has to have undergone a peer review journal is to ensure that it is not just uh, a research that has not been verified, that was, is not, you know, um, you, you cannot lay claim that this has been tried and tested. Particularly for climate change, you need to have undertaken, because we said it informs the information that to allow for decision making. It's, I'm just looking at the time to respond to this. So thank you so much. Uh, we have, as we said, many days, three days ahead uh, in this program. And thank you very much, uh, uh, really, for your uh, presentation, both of the experts in policy brief uh, preparation. Um, so I kindly ask everyone now uh, to, uh, those of you here, uh, not those in the virtual space. We are about now to take a break for a few minutes uh, for coffee. Uh, but before that, we told also this is an important milestone. Uh, maybe we have a quick photo ops uh, just outside among the people who are now here in person. Uh, those of you attending virtually, uh, we are now uh, 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 taking a break for uh, about half an hour uh, and we'll get back to you. Don't go away. Uh, we are very happy you are here as well. Consider yourself you are part of this process. Um, thank you very much again, the presenters uh, and everybody. So let's uh, go out and take a quick photo. Uh,
uh, opt and then uh, have coffee and uh, and then uh, um, the next session um, those of you uh, who are attending the uh, we call them team a um, which is the impact of covid 19 and livelihoods uh, uh, and the climate change group uh, will be uh, uh, going and attending with Dr. Elda uh, at the conference room, Chui. I, I don't know what name they gave it, Chui. Yeah. Um, ah, okay. <laughs> uh, so for Team B, uh, Inclusive Finance for Fragile and Post Conflict States in Africa, uh, you will be uh, working with uh, Professor Adele Adenagan uh, in this uh, right in this room. I know everybody knows where they should be, but I think those uh, virtually they are attended by our IT team over there um, so that you join Team A and Team B. I believe that's how we have organized it. Uh, so uh, we will not lose much time after the break. Thank you so much for attending. Yeah. Well, welcome to the uh, training program. We've had um, a very insightful uh, opening ceremony, and we're going straight to what we have for today. Uh, we'll start with the introduction. Uh, I will try to talk slowly because of our colleagues uh, who are virtual, who are online, and then also because of our colleagues who are francophone, uh, so that the translation can be smooth. I understand we have some of us English speaking here, and we have um, two French speaking here who are on translation, and we have a couple of participants who are online, and they will try to manage this as good as we can. We have quite a large group. Uh, I understand we're having almost 20 uh, participants here. We have almost 20 online too. This is quite a number and then we'll spend a uh, short time to introduce ourselves and be able to manage expectations from each participant. That's quite a lot of work. And then I will first introduce uh, the trainer and then we'll introduce ourselves, maybe five minutes, I introduce myself, uh, my colleague who is also joining us uh, in the training, uh, Dr. Uh, Emmanuel Ujo will also introduce himself, uh, five minutes, and um, please, not more than five minutes. And for the participant, the reason we are trying to do this introduction uh, is not primarily because we want to know your name, we'll get to know your name, interact in the course of the program, but the intention is to be able to know your expectation so that we can manage your expectation in terms of delivery. Uh, we have a concept of how we want to deliver the course, but if we know your expectation, we can always adjust a little. We're not going to change the curriculum, but we can manage um, the delivery so that uh, everyone will benefit uh, optimally from the training. I'll start with myself, five minutes, or if it can be less, we don't have time. Uh, my name is Joseph Adelega, uh, a Nigerian national, but currently residing in the Nordics in Finland. Uh, I have um, over 30 years experience. Uh, I have two doctorate degrees, which some people consider very crazy. <laughs> uh, I have a PhD uh, in civil and environmental engineering from the Nigerian Premier University of Ibadan. That's many years ago. I also have a second doctorate in the United States at the Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland in Ohio, uh, where I specialize in development finance. And um, uh, interestingly, uh, I have um, a balanced view to be able to uh, facilitate this program. Uh, I'm an academician, um, also a practitioner. Uh, I was appointed a professor at the University of Venda 
the whole year in five years, uh, in South Africa five years. I've also been a visiting professor to the Pan-African University in, Cle in um, Clemson, in Nigeria. I've been visiting professor to Commonwealth University in the UK and also in United States. So I have a robust mix experience of academia and practice. In terms of practice, I've worked at the high level at the office of vice president at the ECOWAS, and then we have been an advisor to the vice president, uh, where we have the part of strategy, uh, strategic planning and research there. So we've done several of these um, policy briefs. And then um, I've also, uh, a United Nations official, and the United Nations Office of Project Services in Copenhagen in Denmark, and then um, the global program of the United Nations Tech Innovation Labs program. Interestingly, the person who delivered the opening remarks happened to be my boss, that um, is the global head of the United Nations Tech Innovation Labs program. I've done several other things uh, along the 32 years of my practice. So I understand what policy makers are thinking and also understand what um, academicians are thinking. At some point, I've also been a grantee of the African Economic Research Consortium. I've done research paper like you have done now, so I understand your feelings. I've done the report and it's been accepted. So I've, I, I'm able to navigate. I've done what you have done. And I've been in the policy, I've been in academia. So I'm able to balance uh, the view. So I'll stop at that. So that's pr principally my experience line. So and, um, I, will be, I will be the lead trainer or lead facilitator for this program. And uh, we trust that you have a, a very insightful experience here. Then my colleague will also introduce himself very shortly. Uh, he's from South Africa. Uh, five minutes. Yeah. You no, you can speak there from there. So, uh, colleagues, my name is Emmanuel Ojo. I work as an academic at the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa, precisely in Johannesburg. Um, combined, I've actually worked in global consulting before I joined the university 13 years ago, and it's really been a privilege to be able to work with. Um, quite much, much of my work has actually been working with researchers from, from quite a, um, a multidisciplinary perspective. And the kind of experiences you bring in here will definitely help us in being able to, you know, mediate between practice and policy, especially in writing. So in the course of the three days, we really want to learn from you and as we co-create this space. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's quite short and good. So we'll start from participant here, please. Very short. If you can even do it two, three minutes. Your name, uh, the topic of your research, maybe first the country you come from, the topic of your research, and your expectation. Your area may be COVID uh, and, um, and, and, um, and livelihood, uh, your name, where you come from, and uh, maybe, and what's your expectation, especially, most importantly, your expectation, please. We want to know that so that we can manage that. Maybe you can talk to the mic. Yeah. I'm Jonathan Nata Edu from Ghana. I'm working on uh, financial inclusion, the impact of financial inclusion on household welfare in Burundi. I currently work at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in Ghana as a research assistant on a project on climate smart agricultural practices. Probably I would want you to more light on the expectation aspect. We wanted to know your expectation from the course. For example, let me tell you, what I'm thinking in terms of delivery is that, okay, maybe I can tell you that, that at the end of the three days, we're going to work with you on your AERC project that you have completed. And at the end of three days, you will be able to produce <coughs> policy brief that will deliver results with policymakers. I've been in policy and I know the expectation. So I expect that we, we're going to guide you through each of the structural element of the content of policy brief, about four of them. Each day we're going to go through them. We have, I'll, I'll go through that in the course of this, but I just want to know your expectation. So with that, we've already had a draft. So what I'm really expecting is okay. for it to be fine-tuned. Okay, fine-tuned, okay. Excellent, okay. Thank you. My name is Nicholas Ngepo. I'm from 
the University of Johannesburg School of Economics. And uh, I'm working with a colleague, uh, Regina Moiga, who is online. And uh, um, uh, our work is titled Climate Change and Gender uh, Inequality in the Labor Market in uh, South Africa. Uh, we've uh, finished the work. I have some uh, training on policy brief, but I think that is my views about policy brief is still very clumsy. And okay, uh, clumsy view. Uh, you want a clear view? Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that at the end of this, I should be able. that any document that I produce, any research document that I produce, I should be able to easily translate to a policy brief that is very impactful, starting with this one. Thank you very much. I think okay. that's, that's clear enough. Okay, yeah, that's clear enough. Good morning. I am Isadu from The Gambia. Uh, I'm working with a colleague from Malawi on the effects of Finance, yeah, financial access on women and youths in the Gambia. So I'm expecting that at the end of this course, um, our policy brief will be of high quality and will be easily accepted. Thank you, that's good. Good morning. I'm Esther Cosmas Matthew from Tanzania. I'm working uh, with Jonathan from Ghana, who is my colleague, uh, on agenda analysis of the effect of financial inclusion on asset-based welfare of household in Burundi. Uh, I'm having a Master's of Science in Agriculture and Applied Economics from Sokoni University of Agriculture. And at the end of this course, I'm um, hoping I'll be able to, to write a well-structured poli police brief and which will be uh, understandable to the police makers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Vaida Mante. I'm a Ghanaian, but currently a PhD student at the University of Hohenheim, Germany. And then um, I'm working with my colleagues here. <laughs> we are looking at impact of financial inclusion on household welfare in Liberia, a gendered perspective. Um, as a student we and a researcher, my expectation is that by the end of this course, yeah. I should be it. able to write uh, on technical <laughs> Uh, risk policy brief that would be a bit catchy anybody can read and understand and it will be easy for any policy maker to 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 grab it and apply it thank you my name is francis moaba i'm from liberia uh, me and my colleagues are working on the impact of financial inclusion on household welfare in liberia uh, i hold a master of science in agriculture and applied economics at the end of this uh, training session, uh, what I expect is to get a concise idea on how to draft a policy brief that will help him to display to display to viewer audience that is policy makers, ordinary citizens, and even the grassroots. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Billy Para from Kenya. I'm currently a PhD candidate uh, at the University of Nairobi. Department of Agricultural Economics. I'm part of the Ghanaian, the Liberian team. We are working on a study on the impact of uh, financial inclusion on welfare of households in Liberia. Uh, my expectation at the end of this course is to be able to uh, develop uh, policy briefs that can be used by different le uh, practitioners at different levels of policy. And since uh, I'm also an upcoming researcher, it's of interest, uh, it will give me the ability to be able to translate research outcomes into policy briefs for policy decision making. So thank you thank very you. much. I think that's within the framework of the course. So we are done very well. Okay, mon nom c'est Marthe Moncho, je suis béninoise, je viens du Bénin. Je suis assistante enseignante à l'Université nationale d'agriculture. 
Et mon domaine de recherche, c'est l'élevage laitier et les changements climatiques, l'impact des changements climatiques sur l'élevage laitier et aussi l'impact des émissions de gaz à effet de serre de l'élevage sur euh, euh, le climat. Euh, pour cette formation, mon attente, c'est arriver à communiquer les résultats de mes recherches sans utiliser des mots scientifiques. Jusqu'à maintenant, je n'y arrive pas. Il y a certaines terminologies scientifiques, c'est difficile de monnayer ça en, en terminologie simple. Donc, je n'arrive toujours pas à euh, euh, monnayer certaines terminologies scientifiques en langage que tout le monde connaît. C'est un peu difficile. Donc, je pense que si j'arrive à faire ça, c'est déjà un grand pas pour moi pour faire euh, euh, la note politique. Merci. Thank you. Um, so, Charles Lamene, um, from Eswatini. I'm an agriculture economist. Uh, with my colleagues, we are working on a, a study on the informality for finance, for financing uh, SME enterprises in Eswatini. Uh, my expectation in terms of the course, is, uh, the training is to broaden up in terms of the understanding of development of policy briefs so that we can disseminate information to policymakers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, <coughs> my name is Bongi Wedlamini. I'm from Eswatini at the University of Eswatini. Uh, is my colleague, there are four of us, two I left at home. Uh, our topic, as I said, we're looking at the um, fin inf informality and financing of SMEs in Swaziland. My expectation from this uh, training is to be able, I've never had a uh, training on policy uh, brief, so I'm really excited on this one. My expectation is to uh, come to know how to come up with a non-academic uh, document that is impactful, that can be used by policymakers, because I believe the results we've come up with could be useful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Now we have the two here, and then we'll try to take some virtual our time, we don't have the time, we try our best. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mamadi. I am originally from Burkina Faso. I am based in France. Uh, my research is on climate change and economic development in Africa. Specifically, I work on extreme climate event and conflict in the G5 Sahel countries. Uh, in terms of my expectation, I, I would like to uh, understand theoretically uh, what's a policy a brief and how in practice I can develop the um, high quality uh, policy brief uh, that's going to be useful for policymakers. Thank you very much. My name is James Fumba Sandy. I'm from Sierra Leone. I'm working uh, on mobile money adaptation, credit access, and performance of enterprises in Sierra Leone. A project I've been working with three colleagues, a Ghanaian Jacob, Novino, and a, a lady from Benin, and myself from Sierra Leone. My expectation here is uh, I want, out of this training, I should be able to develop a policy paper, a very sharp one, that will attract uh, policy makers and implementers so that uh, my findings, were, if adopted and used, uh, that will make me very proud and the institution. Thank you very much. So we understand now. We try to give uh, opportunity for our colleagues online to be able to say one or two things. So our time is fast spent. Please, IT, can we give them the opportunity before we start with the presentation? Yes, the virtual. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, ERC. My name is Dr. Rhonda Elizabeth Naziri. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, 
uh, I'm, I am best of the University of Kalamush in South Africa. I am a senior lecturer of development finance and also the director of the African Center for Development Finance. I, I am lecturing uh, mainly in public policy. And so this for me is kind of a train the trainer because I need to pass all this same information to my students. <laughs> uh, in this, uh, today, I'm in here uh, in the capacity of a researcher uh, working on inclusive finance uh, in fragile states. Our project is uh, on um, inclusive finance for women and, children and youths in Mozambique and the DRSC. So what are my expectations? Perhaps to improve my own knowledge of writing a policy brief and be able to uh, transfer the same uh, to my students uh, as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's quite clear. Marshall, you want to go? Amit. 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 Then Clifton and uh, Babajit. Hello. Hello, good morning. My name is Babajide Fowe. I work at the University of Ibadan. And um, in the collaborative group on financial inclusion, my paper is on financial inclusion, gender gaps, and agricultural productivity in Mali. So my expectation for the training workshop is to be able to move seamlessly from writing academic papers to policy papers. Thank you. Thank you, Babajide. Thank you. Martin Wallet. Bye. Hello, bonjour tout le monde. Alors, je suis Mbaye. Je suis professeur à l'université Cheikh Anfou Diop de Dakar. Euh, particulièrement à la faculté des sciences économiques et de gestion. Alors, j'avoue que j'ai l'habitude d'élaborer de, des, des notes de politique économique dans le cadre de certains projets où je participe. Néanmoins, je m'attends toujours à apprendre quelque chose de nouveau à partir de cette formation. Voilà, donc maintenant, je suis curieux de savoir ce que je vais apprendre de nouveau. Et je suis tout disposé aussi à, voilà, à recevoir cette formation. Je travaille sur le projet donc, collaboratif sur les changements climatiques et plus précisément sur voilà, les conditions de transition énergétique en Afrique subsaharienne, les conditions de transition vers les énergies renouvelables. Merci. Rosa, then Tony. Good morning. My name is uh, Saïd Dizouza from Burundi. I'm part of the uh, Anacorta in a research done in Burundi, gender analysis of the impact of uh, financial inclusion. I'm actually a consultant of the uh, IIT of Burundi in the uh, World Bank project, say the year. And uh, I have a great expectation from this thing uh, because uh, we have a lot of splitting, uh, uh, hibernating data so that we can translate it in a policy brief. Uh, policy brief, yeah. I have a great expectation from this thing so that I can be really well skilled in brief policy so that I can uh, uh, value uh, the sleeping information we have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is all? Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, I think um, the introduction is quite good. Uh, now we clearly know that we're on the same page. I think 
the expectation that we trainers have is the same that you have. I like what uh, this, uh, the other participants said that is looking forward to both theoretical knowledge about policy briefs and also the hands-on exercises. So that's very good. So we are going to do some theoretical uh, overview of what the whole structural flame, frames of policy briefs about, and we're going to have hands-on exercise. Thank you. So basically, I will run through the, uh, the module we're going to take for today and in subsequent days before I start the presentation. Uh, we're going to have, um, shortly, we're going to have a presentation uh, on uh, the policy briefs in general, the art of pol policy briefs, and um, some elements of policy briefs. And um, that's what we start with. And after that, we're going to understand policy processes and um, with policymakers' needs. We've had some in the morning during our plenary remarks. We'll delve more into that. And then we're also going to look at the role of policy brief. And um, for the first part, the module one, I'll be doing that. The module two, my colleague, Dr. Emmanuel Ojo will join me in that. And then we're gonna hold the module two in three parts. Uh, I will start <coughs> with the art of policy brief, and then he will intervene in terms of the role of public policy uh, in um, accepting policy briefs. And then I will come up again uh, especially for the participant on climate, he will be looking at inclusive finance and COVID-19, the role of public policy. I will be coming to the other end on um, climate change and economic development to be able to share on the role of public policy. I'll be taking us through uh, what uh, global climate finance architecture is about and also uh, how to design policy briefs uh, to meet a continental agenda on um, climate. Because if you're designing policy briefs, you must understand what is continental agenda on climate change. What is SDG? If you're writing for the UN, you must connect your briefs to SDGs. If you're writing anything, SD is not connected. A UN official will possibly not take you serious. And if you are doing so, you don't understand about Agenda 2063 of the African Union. You expect the policymaker in the African Union space to adopt it. It must be, we'll be looking at a couple of that. And then after that, the afternoon session will be anchored fully by my colleague who will be taking you through the role of social media in communicating research and then um, how to engage on social media platforms. He has quite some insight into that, so we'll be doing that. And um, 4 to 5 p.m., we'll be having primarily exercise uh, on our work. I've read a couple of your work. The way we do it uh, that time is, we're going to run through that in the course of this presentation. We're going to have like a flip chart, and um, we'll take them uh, item by item. Maybe for today, we'll look at your topic. After going through the theoretical framework, we'll look at the topic. Maybe if time permits, we can look at the summary. We have the topic. The summary, that's the only thing we can do today. Tomorrow, when we continue the exercise, maybe we'll look at um, relevance in the context, the contextual framework of your policy briefs. We're we'll possibly looking at um, uh, policy critique. Uh, and maybe the third day, we can look at policy recommendations. And then we we'll also look at whether there is a need for references or citations. As you mentioned during our presentation in the morning, that policymakers do not, they're not interested in citations, they possibly like to know if you suggest further readings. And um, just like we have from Dr. Ayoride, we mentioned that there are also certain cases where you're dealing with policymakers that has, for example, World Bank or ECOWAS, ECOWAS, uh, uh, Economic Community West African State, or other regional economic communities, East African Economic Community, or the Northern part, you know, or Southern Africa Economic Community, in such they have a wealth of documentation and we might need to put some reference, if necessary, what is the limit of references or, 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 or citations that you can put there, but generally that's not required. So we'll be looking at that. So we'll take it one after the other. Maybe today we'll look at two parts. Uh, in the evening, uh, we'll expect that um, we'll have a flip chart 
and uh, we have a group together, and um, then we can have your flip chat. You can write your topic, paste it. We come together, and then uh, we look at it, and we shape your topic. And after that, possibly look at the summary. We come together, we'll, we'll be explaining that, when we get to that. That would be basically the way we're going to do it, so that at the end of the three days, we're able to develop uh, a succinct uh, policy brief. So that's what uh, the whole agenda is about today. So now we move to presentation, the theoretical aspect uh, about presentation on policy brief and part of policy brief. Please, IT. Yes, objective of the course, basically at the end of this module, we're expecting that uh, we'll be able to understand. There are basically two types of policy briefs. We need to understand that. There is the one that is connected to advocacy, and there's one that's connected as objective policy brief. We need to understand that. So we'll be looking at the two types of policy brief for us to understand, so that when you are designing your policy brief, when you are uh, distilling your research into a policy brief, at the back of your mind, you need to know these policy briefs I'm distilling my research paper into, is it for advocacy or is it, for, is it an objective policy brief? That's the starting point. And that will guide you as you, the, the, the way you frame your topic. Then because of the theoretical component of this workshop, and uh, we'll be looking at how do you actually frame your research topics and uh, what is the maximum number of words that we suggest. And then just like when you do your research, you might have to make your research topic catchy, but in terms of policy briefs, it's a bit different, uh, unlike those that can read academic papers we already had in the morning, that policymakers do not have time to read academic uh, papers. Uh, academicians can read that, and uh, but once your topic is not uh, appealing to a policymaker, you just drop it and look for other ways to take his decision, maybe by intuition. <laughs> Some people take decision by intuition. Just take decision by intuition and move on <laughs> without any, <laughs> any sound uh, evidence. Just move on. And that's why possibly we have some of these decisions that we take. Then to gain, gain deep understanding of the characteristics of policy brief. How does policy brief you know, behave? What, what do we expect to see in a policy brief? A good one, you know, characteristic policy brief. Then also acquire knowledge about the structure. What is supposed to be the structure of a policy brief? Uh, what is the structural frame of policy brief? For example, if we have this building now, <laughs> before this building, before it's constructed, this building uh, has frames. You know, you have your pillar there, you have beam some, somewhere there, you have your slab, you have foundation, you have all that. So those are frames. So we're going to have like um, frames for the policy brief. When you now have these frames, then you now begin to build the house. You have your blocks, you have ties, you have all kinds of things. So we look at the structural frame for the policy brief. Then when you have your frame for the policy brief, we're going to look at the content of policy brief. When you have the frame, what is supposed to be done inside, you know, what will be inside. Then we also look at possibly process of conceptualization of a policy brief. And I understand from our introduction now that we have climate change, we have inclusive finance, and we have the impact of COVID-19 and livelihoods. So quite robust group. Interestingly, I have um, quite some experience on climate change. And um, I have my colleague there. He's done quite some stuff on COVID-19. And um, I've also uh, had, as I spoke with inclusive finance, I worked with the developer finance institution before, that was at the ECOWAS level, and I understand uh, the impact of policy brief in this area. So we have two groups uh, who possibly have sound expertise in this area, so which is quite good for us. Then the cost content, what are we looking at? The act of policy briefs, types and characteristics, structure, I think I mentioned that then. We need also to understand uh, policy process, the needs 
and the expectation. That we also try to harness. We have had your introduction, and um, some said they want to fine tune their policy brief. That means it's already done. They want to fine tune. Some said they have a clumsy view. I think colleague from <laughs> from South Africa, and um, is looking forward. I mean, he has <laughs> something that's a bit clumsy, and um, he wants to have something that is catchy. That's quite. Somebody said, "I want to be able to draft a policy brief." That means I've drafted something I've drafted before, but now maybe redraft in the course of this. Some said, "I want improved knowledge," like the participant who says she's um. Uh, lecturing in development finance, I can't remember her name, like this program is like a train the trainer. So the theoretical component will be very much useful to her. Somebody said, I want to translate and um, accelerate research to uh, policy, so all kinds of aspects. So basically, putting that together, uh, for us as trainer, we are looking forward that at the end of the three days, you are able to write a clear, concise, reliable, and consistent policy brief for a government official. That is very critical. And then um, you know uh, who are the ones who are who are the ones that, that's going to read uh, your policy brief we've had in the morning. What are the expectations? Also write policy briefs that is strategic and meet the needs of the reader. Just like we had in the morning that sometime you work in an organization and a decision is supposed to be taken. And um, sometimes, some, a lot of government officials, many times, mistake policy brief for several things. Some call brief notes. Th these are different. We'll be taking a look at that. What actually are they? You know, they are, many of them are not policy briefs. They think they are, but they are not. So understand the different types of policy briefs and how, to, how their purpose differ. The purpose of your policy brief will inform the content you know, just like if you work for an organization, like Dr. Ayurindo was mentioning Monday, look, if you work for an organization, they expect you, you know, to get a policy brief out for them. So the expectation, as was mentioned, that that one will possibly be longer than the one page or 700 words uh, that we mentioned earlier. Now, we'll start with the introduction uh, for this uh, module. What actually is a policy brief? We say policy brief is a knowledge transfer tool. That's what I've coined. It's a tool. And you must know how to use the tool. And then you must know what the tool intends to do. So it's a knowledge transfer tool that has been increasingly used in recent years as a way to inform or influence public policy decisions. It's a tool that has been used. And then it's a proven tool, if you had, during the opening remarks I made, is a proven tool and um, it has effect, but many times policymakers don't read them or it's not well adopted for several reasons. Because policy briefs are designed by a variety of, are, are, are designated by a variety of times, some call it policy note, some people call it research snapshot, some people call it that way. And um, I'm prepared in various formats. It can be difficult to determine how to go about writing one. If there's OK, research snapshot, policy note. Policy note is different from policy brief. It's quite a bit different. It's different. And um, so it can be dif difficult to determine how to write one. We'll be examining what exactly is this policy brief. And most importantly, we'll be looking at the criteria that needs to be met to produce a high policy brief. And the writing guides are also of interest. What are the guidelines to write policy briefs? One of the key learning outcomes of this module to assist uh, knowledge producer in writing policy brief based on their research evidence. I've mentioned the characteristics of policy brief, the various components that it has so that we can maximize, maximize the potential. And this model that we are looking at is based on practitioner scholar viewpoint. There's something called practitioner scholar, which is a practitioner that also has uh, scholarly training and experience. 
I have worked with different, different, I've worked with different models of policy briefs uh, to determine the consideration of policymakers. And consideration is also given to factors that support or limit the extent to which policymakers take evidence into account. What are the factors? Why is it that they don't take it uh, sometime very seriously? I think we'll be looking at that in the course of the second presentation. Research evidence versus policy briefs. Disseminating research evidence and systematic reviews is one of the ways uh, to influence decisions made during public policy development. However, the survey of such results and encouraging their use by policymakers and the stakeholders poses very, very serious challenge. And the reason why it poses major challenge is because of different expectations and because of knowledge gap between the policymaker and also between the one that is providing the evidence. This is primarily because of issues related to complexity of both knowledge generation and policy, policy development. There's a process that policy development often takes, and there's a process for which knowledge generation often takes. They are at the other extremes. So I've been able to look at the midline to put them together to disseminate. However, a number of knowledge transfer tools have been developed to address these challenges, which include policy brief, among others. So the knowledge transfer tool have attracted wide acceptance, especially in the last decade. <coughs> it's been something that is widely accepted as a tool to communicate. The wide acceptance stem from the efforts made by many international organizations to communicate information more concisely <coughs> to policymakers. Principally, in recent, in recent years, several <coughs> international organizations have come to realize the role of policy briefs. For example, African Development Bank and a lot of international or regional development finance institutions have taken interest in policy brief. I mentioned at the other time that even at the Islamic Development Bank, their research department had started producing policy briefs. And when students are attached to them on internship or as visiting scholar, they mandate them to be able to produce policy brief from their research. It also coincides with a trend towards funding agencies. That's also very important now with funding agencies, donors, development finance institutions, and for some of us in climate change with the global international uh, climate finance architecture that are on ground now. I'm sure many of us will know them working in climate change. We have climate investment fund, we have a um, green climate fund where Dr. Ayorinde worked and presented in the morning. We have adaptation fund. We have global environmental facility. We have a couple of these funds out there. And um, it's becoming very, very common. It's a trend now that funding agencies are placing stricter demands on knowledge producers. Uh, they require them to assure responsibility for facilitating the use of scientific results outside of the areas. It's becoming a very, very serious demand now for them. So it's something that international organizations are pushing through. Uh, development finance institutions are putting through. Global climate finance architecture are also pushing through. So policy brief, uh, yes, sir. Uh, oh. I can give you a mobile microphone. I see you're a dynamic person. OK, so thank you. <laughs> OK, OK, thank you. Maybe we can push this. Yeah? Okay, maybe you can move this one. Uh, okay, I'll try. Okay, I'll use it. Don't worry, I'll use it. Okay, I'll use that. Okay. So basically, policy brief is the term most frequently used to describe briefing papers that summarize research based evidence. That's just, you have evidence from your research, uh, you have done your research, do your analysis, run your complex methodology, use your model. And um, at the end of the day, I know many times people just put at the end policy recommendations, but those policy recommendations many times don't go anywhere. They are just things we just extrapolate from our mind and not necessarily connected to. So they are basically used to describe briefing papers that summarize research based evidence. But it's not adequate to just put policy recommendations at the end of uh, our research output, but it's good 
to describe this, to, to produce a policy brief that is connected to it, and how do you go about doing it? However, a broad range of vocabulary is used to describe other closely related documents, for instance. Some people call it briefing papers, some call it briefing notes, some call it evidence brief, some call it evidence summary, some call it summary, uh, summary of findings, some call it a research snapshot, some call it research summary. There are different names uh, is being called. In French, uh, people call it brief, not the political, politic, no technique, all kinds of names is called in French. And, uh, but the term policy brief is often used to refer to other closely related documents. There are other closely related documents that many times people mistake them for policy brief, but policy brief do have uh, special characteristics in terms of content and also in terms of the format. Many times it's very confusing to us as researchers, researchers and also to policy makers. And as such, it creates a problem for us to use it as a knowledge, knowledge transfer tools. So one of the key learning outcomes of the MODI to guide knowledge producers, researchers, scientific advisors, or analysts through the writing of an evidence-informed policy for policymakers. Okay, now, we want to look at common types of briefing documents. There are different types of briefing documents. For example, we have information brief, which is a document, policy approaches and methods, and any other aspect of policy, policy development process. We have issue brief, summarize the best available research on a problem so as to identify the field of policy action. We also have policy brief, which is what we are looking at today, a summary of evidence-based best practice and preferred policy options. So it's, it's a bit different than policy impact brief. We summarize the evidence uh, concerning different things, health, social, economic, budgetary. In, in this case, we're looking at um, the case of COVID-19, climate change and all, all sorts. Now, we've talked about different types of briefing documents. Now, what are policy briefs? A policy brief is a concise summary. This is a theoretical framework that a colleague was asking, your uh, colleague was asking for. A concise summary of a particular issue. In this case, your research paper, the topic, the research you have conducted. Then the policy options to deal with and some recommendations on the best option. So in terms of policy brief, we are looking at a particular topic, particular research in a research area that at the end of it provide different policy options. Different ones are harnessed. So in the course of our workshop, we'll be looking at different policy options from your output and also recommending the best option. Based, and it's, that's why I said, in, in, we were having an opening remark that it's very important for us to be able to do this effectively. You need to understand what is, um, for example, global agenda in your uh, area of research. You need to understand the continental agenda in terms of your research. And then you also need to know what is, for example, SDGs. If you're working on climate change, for example, you need to understand what is the thinking of, for example, UNFCCC, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change? What is the output from the Conference of Parties on Climate Change that we held every year, every two years? You should be interested in that. Otherwise, there is no way you can recommend the best option if you don't understand what policymakers are thinking. So it deals with summary of a particular issue in terms of policy, then the options to deal with specifically in your case and to recommend the best option. How do you think is the best op option? So these are some of the things we'll be working with uh, specifically on your paper. It is aimed at government policymakers and others who are interested in formulating 
impact or influencing policy. A very important area that we have often missed, and there's a gap, is that many times policymakers do not actually take decisions based on our policy briefs. They, they, they often have advisors, the advisor to the president, advisor to the vice president, advisor to a direct, we have different advisors. So it's these advisors in principle that will provide the advice. <laughs> you know, you can see those layers. So you must produce document that even the advisor can read and the advisor, advisor now summarize what he has read. <laughs> That's two layers, you know, to the one who will make the advice. So it's aimed primarily at policymakers and others who are interested. The brief can take different formats. A typical format is a single A4 that contains perhaps, in my experience, 700 words. <laughs> I remember Dr. Ayori said um, it should be a page, a pager. 700 words, a page and a half, two pages. It has an attractive design. I may have one or more photographs. If you've seen policy brief, it also has a photograph. Or uh, many times, longer brief, I've seen longer brief, up to eight pages, and other formats, they are possible. Just like um, the Dr. Ayurid was mentioned, that sometimes it could be five pages, it could be, I've seen some as high as eight pages, especially when you are having policy brief from like uh, World Bank, you are having from, I've seen some from, um, World Bank, I've seen some from African Union. Some of these large organizations, when they are trying to distill you know, research evidence, African Development Bank often have large policy brief because there's a volume of knowledge that is so much that they want to transmit. But ideally, it shouldn't be more than a page or max a page and a half. So that's one key thing we have to take home. I've just put an example of policy brief Unfortunately, I cannot read that there, but there are different formats, different pictures, and um, you can see the way it is. These are extract of policy brief, I think, from, um, from um, FAO and um, from different international organizations. So those are examples. In the course of um, the workshop, uh, I think module four will be showing templates uh, that will be specifically uh, connected to your area of um, research, we'll be working on that together. It shows designing template to suit facilitators, participants. Now, types of policy brief. Before you start writing your policy brief at all, we need to understand the various types of policy brief. In principle, there are two types of policy brief, basically two types. And if there's anything you can take out of this meeting, understand there's advocacy briefs, and as an objective brief. Advocacy brief argue in favor of a particular course of action, while on the other hand, objective brief gives balanced information for the policymaker to make up his mind. So that's another one. And um, I think many times, objective brief is what most policymakers would prefer, especially from a researcher. Advocacy view, many times, maybe if you have an organization that want to take a decision or commission a research, you can have a particular course of action. But objective view, you give policy options. And then maybe at some point, you may suggest that this uh, option may be the best in this particular context that we're looking at. In some other context, might not be. So we have advocacy brief, and we have um, the other one, objective brief. So the purpose of policy brief is to convince target audience of the urgency. You have to create urgency of the current problem. You have to make them understand that this matter you are dealing with is urgent. And then there's a need to prefer preferred alternative or course of action outlined and therefore serve as an impetus for action. You're saying that, look, there is urgent problem, maybe it's climate change, it's inclusive see finance on COVID-19, is so urgent, compelling uh, evidence from your research is so urgent, and then um, action need to be taken, and then you are now prefer, you know, that, that course of action, maybe some options, some policy options that they can take. And it's so 
imperative, especially if it's not a commission research. This, in your case, you chose your research topic based on a general team that ARC had proposed to you, and your paper is assessed and um, is approved. You do your research, you come up with some research evidence. So to make policymakers who did not commission your research to be able to take interest in what you're doing, in crafting your policy brief, you must be able to understand the thinking, what is most, what is the interest of your stakeholders who want to read your policy brief? And that's why I mentioned, the other time you must understand uh, regional economic community, the agenda of regional economic com communities. For example, you have um, the, the COMESA, you have uh, East African uh, Development Community, you have ECOWAS. What in your area of research, what is their thinking, what is on top of their agenda as a regional economic community? Secondly, we are from Africa. What is African Union agenda? There is this African Union Agenda 2063, which I will expect uh, researchers to be aware of it. If you're not aware in the course of this workshop, please take a look at that. There are African Union Agenda 2063. Uh, there are baselines, there are indicators, there are expectations. So you must understand that, especially in your area of research. That is the only way you can communicate to your audience. If you are in climate change, like some on climate change and economic development is very important if you're not aware before to understand what is UNFCCC and um, if you don't know about it, United Nations Framework Convention for Climate Change. They do have conference of parties uh, on this climate change and I think they meet yearly or biannually and then at the, at the end of it, they come up with uh, what countries need to do, what is top on the agenda, they call this intended national de determined contribution from each countries. How we want to limit the GHG by this 1.5 degrees, 2 degrees, or whatever. And then, so you must understand that. Otherwise, those are the things that will interest governments. If you have, for example, government of Ghana, they say, okay, I want to have my intended national determined contribution. I want to have, for example, uh, the percentage of renewables in my energy mix is 5%. I want to increase to 10%. What are they doing? What policy options are they putting in place to be able to maybe migrate from fossil fuel to clean energy? So you must understand that. If you don't understand that, your research may not make much meaning to them. Also in terms of adaptation, you know, what are they thinking about? What is uh, adaptation fund, for example? What are they thinking about, you know? What is top on the agenda? In terms of inclusive finance, COVID-19 is there. The UN is doing a lot on COVID-19. The EU is doing a lot on COVID-19. So you must read that. You must understand what is top on their agenda. Otherwise, you cannot serve them. In principle, the policy brief is a document which outlines rationale for choosing a particular policy alternative or course of action in the current policy debate. You must understand what is current policy debate. It's not adequate for us to do our research. You must understand the policy debate, what is hot on the agenda in each area. You know, for example, COVID-19, what's hot on the agenda for COVID-19? What is hot on inclusive finance? And climate change and economy, what's hot there? So you must understand that that is what makes your policy brief to be relevant. And it is commonly produced in response, most of the time, response to a request directly from a decision maker. That is what is very common, or within an organization that intend to advocate or position detail, or position detail in, 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 in the brief. Many times, international organization, uh, for example, African Union, African Development Bank, United Nations, uh, for example, Green Climate Fund, Climate Investment Fund, Adaptation Fund. Recently now we have this organization that just started, Global Center for Adaptation, is on climate change too. It's in Netherlands, but hosted in African, the African office is hosted in African Development Bank. They are doing a lot on policy briefs 
connected to climate change, especially devoted to adaptation. You must understand what they are thinking. They are producing lots of documents, Global Center for Adaptation. You can check that, you know, at the end of this meeting. You must understand what they're doing. Many times, policy briefs come as a request uh, from a decision maker and, um, or within an organization that intends to advocate or have a position and they want to take a decision on it. But in the case, in our case, we have research we have done. It's not an organization that called for it. <laughs> it's not a decision maker. You have a heavier task. <laughs> your task is heavier than um, or our task, not your task, where I need to get that. Our task is heavier <laughs> than somebody whose organization have called for a policy. That means for that one, you guarantee they will read it. But whether they will take any of your policy uh, recommendations or your, uh, every, or, 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 your, or, your, or your critique is at their disposal. But you are producing a policy brief that is not called by an organization, it's not called by a decision maker, and you want them <laughs> to use it. I remember uh, one of the participants said, it will be my joy if <laughs> my policy brief is used uh, for decision. <laughs> and, um, and, and when I was doing the opening remarks, remember that I said that Studies have shown that most policy briefs that is produced are not used. There's a disconnect. So we have heavier, heavier task to be able to connect uh, between policymaker and our research evidence. And that's why when we go through this, how do we choose a policy brief title? We'll be looking at that very briefly shortly, which is very, very important so that in fact, when we're choosing it, we have to ensure that it is connected to a policy debate. Please put that at the back of your mind. If you want, for example, me to read a document, if I see the title, I may decide to read or I may decide not to read at all. If it's connected to current policy debate in your thematic area, you most likely want to read it. So that's what will inform how you craft your topic you know, you have your research. How do you craft it to connect to a current policy debate? And we'll be spending some time today to look at crafting, you know, uh, research, uh, your policy brief title. We'll have flip chart all over this place. And each and every one of us, you have your title of your policy brief. Myself and my colleague will have a group, maybe I'll possibly stay with the climate change and um, green and economic development. And uh, my colleague will possibly look at COVID-19 and then we can both interject uh, between uh, uh, inclusive finance. We can do that together so that we can look at what is current policy debate. A lot of topics we choose might not interest no one. And at the end of the day, nobody ever read such paper. So put, if there's anything you can get from this workshop, understand that the topic of your policy brief must fit into current policy debate in your area. Hot policy debate. What is most important in your area? So if it's that, it will be catchy. I've seen cases when I'm traveling, I'm in the airplane, I just take uh, some of these airplane newsletter and something catch me there. You know, sometimes they write on topical issues. If they write on climate change, they write on this, and you pick it. And you just want to, some just look at it, you throw it there because it doesn't fit into topic of debate. So that's very, very important. On the other hand, on the other end of the scale, it could be we also have advocacy brief, which focus directly on providing an argument for adoption of a particular alternative. Advocacy is brief, it's much more complicated because you're making your decision maker to think with you, <laughs> to agree with you on a particular course of action, in principle, you are arguing your case. It's like you're in a court of law. <laughs> and you're arguing your case, you want the judge to accept <laughs> what you're saying. This is correct. And it takes, your thinking must be aligned with the judge. Listen, in this case, your judge is a policymaker. But in case of objective brief, I think it's easier. You are just throwing out a couple of options. You can do this, you can do this, you can do this, then you can choose. But in case of advocates, it's, it's more stricter. So uh, you must be able to fit your thought into his thought. Otherwise, he would never accept. So the policy brief is a knowledge transfer tool used in various fields of action, which aim 
to inform decision making related to selection, development, adoption, and implementation of public policy. That's quite a task. Yes, please. You are allowed to interject, please, in the course. You can interject anytime. We'll stop. Please, I forgot to mention that, please. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question about the purpose. Uh, sometimes uh, the policymakers don't, you, you are working on a topic that you know that it's topical, but the policymakers are not interested. For, in, for, for instance, fighting against corruption, uh, the policymaker may not be interested want to bring together uh, strategic partners that can contribute to bring the public awareness about uh, the, the phenomenon. So in that case, the purpose is that you will have a brief that's not going to, uh, to be oriented to the policymaker, but to some maybe the civil society may, or, or maybe some different actors than, than policymakers. Okay, we'll answer that. Dr. Ojo, please, you can also help me out. When, let a second question. If you want to intervene, please intervene. Yes, please. thank you very much, yes. uh, Prof. Uh, you have given the two areas, policy paper, of course, uh, brief and the mere economic You know, in the society in which we live now, I think uh, advocacy has been played a vital role. government to, to make certain things. And if government, most government, if they do not adhere to them in some aspect, sometimes they can even make them unpopular. And uh, we've seen in the past, I'm coming from Sierra Leone, yes. we've been doing some research for some organization. I think the advocacy aspect of it has been very productive. You can use them directly. Like you said, uh, you should have the convincing power so that to win people over to buy your idea and to be implemented. When you make policy uh, brief in, on paper, yeah, they will listen to you. Sometimes to get them to even come to the workshop to convince them on those things. Sometimes they send junior officers who, are, who do not really take part, but just to represent their organizations or uh, the MBAs into those workshops. And their presence would not really mean much. They tend to have more, to say, uh, we don't have time, or at least one junior staff to go. Those things have not been productive. But if you are able to get the civil society to listen to you, uh, listen to their question, and be able to convince them during your presentation, you can tend to win them over. And they can buy your ideas and make, maybe forward it to members of parliament, those that they are very close to them. And they will hit the central government officers very hard. And if they don't, and uh, sometimes they have been, been so unpopular in each on issues. Thank you very much. That's a very, very good uh, question. Oh, you want to answer the question? Well, perhaps not an answer. Okay. Maybe <laughs> a view. I've Contribution. Okay. Oxfam. Oxfam, okay. Quite a, a, a long while uh, heading research for them in Southern Africa. And that was actually the challenge. And usually, I think it is. First of all, by the way, it's the first time I'm seeing the dichotomy of objective policy brief. And advocacy policy. So okay. This is something that is bringing some objectives that I have Thank for you. the workshop coming home. Thank you. But uh, now it provokes these things in my mind that um, quite often we forget that uh, it's not just like the corruption case. There are usually many lobby groups in any case. Hmm. Take, for example, the question of energy transition, hmm. where I have argued, as much as I know the dangers of the use of coal. Coal, the coal fire plants, yeah. Yes, that uh, so many uh, developed countries have developed on the back of dirty energy. Yes, and now they're and asking I, us to go renewables. Then now, uh, the, everyone <laughs> says <laughs> go, renewables. go renewables. Yes. <laughs> now you have powerful lobby groups. Yes. And when you do research, you want to pass it across. Yes. Even though you chose the research topic and you think that they might not object, I think it is always safer to think that this is an advocacy policy as opposed to an objective policy 
unless they ask you to do it, because I've also done work for governments, when they ask you to do it, it means it is something they have interest in and they want to get the facts. Then you have to present to them objectively. Objectively. But when you are the researcher, you choose the topic based on the problem statement and then you do your research, you come up with whatever you come up with, you must present your policy brief as if it were uh, an advocacy policy brief. Thank you yeah. very much. Then in that case, then you, you need some great deal of lobbying like the other colleague has explained. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. That's, that's, that's quite insightful. I'll provide some response and I'll allow, allow Dr. Ojo to comment. To me, uh, I want the class to be as interactive as possible and I'm very happy with the way you are interjecting, which is very good. We can pick different you know, opinions and um, be able to learn from each other, not only myself delivering the speech. <laughs> you know, the, the, the interesting thing uh, you have said is very important. You have said that you talk about fighting against corruption. And one of the key things, if you present a brief and you are talking about corruption, government will shut down on you. Nobody will listen to you. And uh, because you're basically telling them they are corrupt. <laughs> Why should they come and listen to you? <laughs> they will not listen to you. But it depends on how you craft your topic. You can be diplomatic in how you craft your topic. You may not call it corruption. <laughs> there's a way you can recraft it. Uh, I, I can't think of something, but there's a way you can think it uh, about transparency or something. You know, like you have transparency international. So that's what you can call it. But the moment you shut at them, you say this corruption. They're not diplomatic at all. So even in your topic, oh, corruption, in, nobody will say, oh, corruption, they've come again. They close it. So your topic is very important. And if you're going to do that, I think um, Dr. Ojo will be doing something on the impact of social media. You know, if they can't listen to that, they will listen to social media, tweet, uh, blogs, all kinds of things. That one is so quick. And I think that's an area we're going to delve into here. You know, the impact of social media in communicating your research. There are certain things, if you put policy brief or corruption, nobody will listen to you. You know, they just say, oh, they shut down. But in crafting our topic, as I said, the topic crafting is very, very important. In crafting your topic, you must make it appealing to the one that's really, especially uh, government official. The more you mention corruption, they won't read it. But I can't remember, I can't, maybe in the course of uh, this workshop, I could think about how you can craft your topic. You won't call corruption, and you can, for example, you have this glass, no, it's half full or half empty. You are still talking about the same thing, it's this way. But when you call corruption, they won't listen to you. If I had the advisors, the advisor who will read it and disseminate to the vice president, you already say corrupt, no, you shut down, that's the end. So the way we present our advocacy is also <laughs> very, very important. Uh, in your topic, it has to be very important. It, you have to be diplomatic <laughs> in what you put down. Even in your writings, you have to be diplomatic in your writings. And then, then coming to this one, we're going to deal with framing of topic. Uh, uh, on the issue of uh, the other one about renewables, I've worked extensively in this area, and um, it's a very big debate. And if you come and you say, um, we are doing a, 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 a policy brief, and you just say uh, Africans, uh, Africans should continue uh, on the path of coal fire plants. And ap after all, uh, the, the West, they develop on coal fire plants, and um, why should they stop us from development? Nobody will listen to you, <laughs> because that's not the global agenda. That's not the global agenda. That's not the way the world is thinking about. If you look at the African Union agenda, Agenda 2063, African Power Vision 2063, what they are talking about is how to increase the percentage of renewables in the energy mix. For example, Ghana made their, their, their policy. They, are, they intend to increase, uh, I can't remember, maybe 10% by the end of the year. So, okay, we have fossil fuel, we have coal fire plants, we don't have enough capacity now to transit to renewables 100%, but we are putting uh, a plan in place in our intended national determined contribution from Conference of Parties on Climate Change. We say we want to increase from, let's say, we are 10% renewables now. By the end of the year, we want to be 15% renewables. 
if you just say policy brief on increase, for example, topic increasing renewables in our energy mix, they will listen to you. But you are still saying the same thing. You are not saying stop coal fired plants. You are not saying stop fossil fuel. But you are saying increase. So if you say that, if you write it like that, they will listen to you. You know that means if you can achieve ten percent renewables next year, you shift forward. Increase your renewables from ten to twenty percent. They will listen to you. The other one, twenty to thirty percent. But the moment you come on the aggressive lane and you're saying, "Oh, you want to fight corruption? Policy brief on how to fight corruption. Policy brief on um, on on continue to use coal. Nobody will listen to you. So, how you craft your topic to fit into global debate? You are saying the same thing. What is hot? For example, on climate change, on renewables in the global agenda. What is hot there? The hot is renewables. We don't want to continue. We have only one planet. <laughs> we don't want to mess it up. Forget about debate, what the West is doing. That's not what we're talking about here. What is the policy? What is the agenda? Renewables, increase the percentage. They will read it. They will, read it. They will listen to you. So not on the aggressive side, not on the diplomatic side, but crafting your topic to appeal to policymakers. Please, Dr. Oju. Yeah. Um, thanks, um, Professor Adelagan. Thanks to our colleagues for the kind of questions they are asking. Quite interesting. <coughs> I think what I really want to say is about two, three statements. The first thing is that we need to understand that when you write a policy brief, see it as a sales speech. It's not about your brilliance. It's not about how many variables you were able to pack into your model. It's not about how brilliant your model is. It's about the idea you want to sell. And in selling your idea, you need to know how to use the right words. Okay? It's like trying to woo a woman. You <laughs> must know exactly what to say. And in the next session, we are going to look at exactly how do we use social media as a strategic way to communicate research in a very concise, readable, and meaningful way. But the questions and the comments coming from the ground is really very important. And ultimately, we will definitely get somewhere at the end of today. Thank you. Thank you very much for that insight. So we'll continue with our presentation. If you have any question in the course, please interject. We can talk on it. But what we all agreed in our uh, uh, present state of knowledge that we have about policy brief is that your topic is very important, communicating your policy that is connected to current global debate is very important. And um, in terms of your topic, just like Dr. Ojoa said, you are advocating for an argument. If you come on the aggressive side, you come on the side how to fight corrupt government, you want them to read. You come on the side, oh, how can we continue to, to do uh, renewables? We must continue to pollute. Nobody will listen to you. Nobody will listen to you. Nobody will, it will never say because you have come on the, right, on the wrong side of policy. That is not what policy is saying in, 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 in Africa. That's not what policy is saying. For example, a country like Cape Verde is almost becoming increasing. Their, their renewables almost coming to 100%. They are, they, are, they are increasing. Ghana is increasing. Climate change is hot on the agenda. If you are going back to say, continue to use fossil fuel, nobody will read your, your they put your paper aside. So we must know how to do that. Please, let's continue. I think we've gone past this one. Sorry. Sorry, I'm trying to get, okay, where we stop? Where am I from? Okay, we are here. We've talked about this, and then so the purpose of policy is to convince a target. Okay, we've talked about this. In principle, the policy brief is a document which outlines. Okay, it is commonly produced. Okay, we've done this. Okay, yes, depending on the role of the writer organization producing the document, the brief 
may only provide a targeted discussion on the current alternatives without arguing a particular one. That's objective. Then advocacy, I think we've also talked about this. Yes, sir. Okay, it's okay. Okay, two. <coughs> what to look at now on the characteristics of policy brief. What are the characteristics? What should a policy brief do? What is the function of a policy brief? One, policy brief should provide enough background for the reader to understand the problem. They must understand. You're saying there is an urgent problem for which they need to take action. Remember, this is different from when they have commissioned you. <laughs> when they commission you to do it, they understand there's a problem and organization have commissioned you to do that. But this one, nobody commissioned you. <laughs> African Economic Research Consortium commissioned a research for you. Then, like Dr. Ojo said, you want to sell it to a government who did not commission <laughs> your research. They didn't commission it. So it must fit. P should give enough background for the reader to understand the problem. So you must provide some context in the course of the characteristics. We look at contextual framework context to provide the reader with to understand the problem. If they don't understand the problem, they just they will drop it somewhere. Where is the problem here? For example, let's take the case of, um, of, of, of corruption you're talking about the other time. They must understand what's the gravity of the uh, problem. They need to be transparent. If it's okay, transparent is fine. If it's okay, increasing renewables in the energy mix, they understand the problem. So contextual light is we have only one planet and if we go at this rate we're going, a time will come, but people are saying that if we go at the rate we are going, we possibly need three planets <laughs> in 2050. The rate we're going now, we need three planets. So we, do, we, we don't have three planets, <laughs> we have one. So how do we help the only one planet that we have? So if you say continue on the part of um, Thank you for that. Okay. So what should a policy brief do? That is what we intend to look at. My colleague just uh, sent a note to me that say we need to stop. We have lunch in two minutes. <laughs> yes, in two minutes. So I think um, I have to stop here. And then uh, we take it up from there after lunch. And then we'll look at characteristics of policy brief. I think we, we actually spend some time before we start, maybe we lost like 30 minutes before we start, and um, but that's not a problem. So at one, we continue of characteristics of policy brief, and uh, we're looking at um, types of policy brief, the content and all that. And we also try to see how we can understand policy processes, and uh, Dr. Ojo will share that, and we also come in there. We hope that we can finish this by 1 p.m., I'm not too sure, not very positive about that, but I hope we can uh, still some time, maybe on day two, <laughs> and then before we come to designing templates, there's a lot packed in here. So we'll stop here, and then when we come back from lunch, we'll start on what should a policy brief do, and uh, then we'll proceed to address the content of policy brief, each and every one. I think we have about four contents of policy brief, and we're going to dissect that, and we come down to how to actually conceptualize policy briefs. And um, I think a large part of our time will be devoted to practical exercises. Thank, uh, Cecilia, we thank Cecilia for giving us this one, it's very good. So each and every one of us can write our topics. Maybe somebody will write how to fight corruption, I will say no, <laughs> we're not going to fight corruption here. Or somebody will say no, um, let's continue uh, coal fire plant, how to continue, or how to continue renewables or whatever. So we sit together and uh, look, at, uh, we just stand together and say, look, let's reframe the topic this way. So that's one thing we do together. Then we we'll go to summary and all that. So there's a hard stop at one, so we stop here. Thank you very much. So we'll continue. So this session is over for now. So we take our lunch and come back when, let's say, at 2 p.m. Thank you so much.
Thank you very much. Uh, we, we are continuing with um, laying the theoretical background for well catching policy briefs. Now we are at characteristics of policy brief. Actually, we're supposed to do at this time understanding the role of social media in communicating research. But uh, we lost some time during the opening ceremony, and uh, we went to take photographs. I think we lost almost 40, 50 minutes there. And um, the opening remark, we also asked, there are some questions and all that have been asked. So sorry about that. So this one, uh, we consider it important to lay the theoretical foundation, uh, which we are going to build on during the group exercises. If we don't have this foundation, it's difficult to work at 4 p.m. So I'll try to be as fast as I can while still also delivering quality theoretical background. And in the course of it, Dr. Ojo will join to give the understanding of social media. So characteristic of policy brief. So policy brief should provide enough background for the reader. We've, we've talked about that before we go to lunch. It should also convince the reader what should a policy, policy brief do? That's what we're looking at. It should convince the reader that the problem must be addressed urgently. As we have said, this is not uh, a case of a commissioned policy brief. It's a, cause, it's, it's, it's a case of a research uh, commissioned by African Economic Research Consortium. And um, if you are disseminating it in that, distilling your research into policy brief, then you must show that this problem is quite urgent and that your reader uh, should know that uh, it's something that fits into their own development agenda or into the continental agenda or global agenda. Policy brief should also provide information about alternatives. That is in the case of an objective brief. We talk about objective and um, advocacy brief or it should provide evidence to support one alternative. That's in the case of ad advocacy brief. We've talked about that. Policy brief should also stimulate the reader to make a decision. So the reader must be willing to make a decision. It's not just reading. We're saying make a decision on this now by virtue of the brief I'm presenting to you. And um, I like the statement that um, Dr. Ojo mentioned that it's like you're selling a product, <laughs> you want them to buy the product, so you must make a case for it. Policy, then, what should a policy brief contain? What should a policy brief contain? What should be inside a container called policy brief? If it's a structural frame, what should the frame be made of, the element of it? Policy brief should be short and to the point, that's number one. It should focus on a particular problem or issue. In principle, this is a caution. We should not go into all the details. All the details are not necessary. All your background, problem, statement, rationale for study, all those jargons and research, they don't need it. It's not necessary. And they provide enough information for the reader to understand the issue and to come for a decision, to a decision. Just adequate information contextual background, what is the issue? Then policy briefs should be based on firm evidence. Firm evidence, not just one or two experiences in a single year. Just like you are doing your research and um, you just collect your data for six months and it's an isolated study, maybe a case of um, a Kenya, and in Kenya you study maybe only Mombasa, and um, some limited sample size, you, can, you can't advise somebody on that. So it should be something that draw evidence from various sources, preferably from several different areas, organization. So it's not a study limited in scope. You know, in some research, when you conclude your research, you put there a limitation. You know, at the end, it's something people normally do, uh, study limitation. Uh, areas that need further improvements. 
I know people used to put that. If your policy brief, if your research has too much of that, then I'm afraid. I don't think it's, it, it fits into what we're talking about because you're talking of, if, if you're doing that, you're talking of a space that you have no mastery, you know. You can't advise them on your research if it has a limited scope. So I think you should be thinking about your research now. Does it have limited scope? Is it only applicable to, maybe if you're from Tanzania, is it applicable only to Arusha? <laughs> or you're from a place like Nigeria, a, a study in maybe in your state, <laughs> you want to advise. So you have to be very careful about that. Policy brief should focus on meanings and not methods. We should understand that when you're writing your policy brief, policymakers are not interested in your method, your methodology, your quantitative display, your all kinds of your analysis. They're not interested. Mixed method research, uh, case study, focus group, group discussion, what have you, or the type of software. They're not interested in your methods. We need to understand that it should not be there. If it's in the draft policy brief you have designed now that we are looking at, please realize that we need to get that off. Then policy brief should relate to the big picture. The policy brief may build on context-specific findings, but it should draw conclusions that is generally applicable. Yes, it could be context-specific, but your conclusion, your recommendations should be applicable generally. If you can apply it generally, then there is a big problem. Like um, um, the participant uh, working on climate change and gender, am I correct? Yeah. yeah. So gender is something that is generally applicable. And um, depending on your sample size and the type of research you do, you can provide, you know, some objective, you know, policy briefs and then provide different options. So that is doable. So that's also something we need to look at very well. We also need to understand, <coughs> especially when policy briefs are commissioned by organization or by a wide uh, publisher, you say many are part of a series. You might need to check with the series editor or the head of the publication or public awareness unit in your organization for any requirement. Sometime in a place like the United Nations or a place like uh, Development Finance Institution, Islamic Development Bank, for example, there was a time um, I had um, these two students. Uh, I supervised their master's thesis at the Pan-African University in Clemson, in Nigeria. And um, as part of their process, they were a part of their studies, they were attached to the Islamic Development Bank. So I had to relate with the director of research in ISDB. So the reason they were selected among the 42 students in that class, I think the class was a class on energy policy, and that was because there is a particular topic series that Islamic Development Bank was working on. And they wanted to take their research, distill it to policy brief, to fit into that part of series. So sometimes it's like that. They came there, I think they were there for six months or three months, I can't remember. So in that case, you need to check the total number of words. So if it's a series, they are doing policy brief one, maybe I think the student work on something like climate change, uh, something renewable, uh, renewable energy uh, in chat or something, you know, I can't remember now. So that one you need to ask, check the need for the total number of words. If it's a series, they have series on renewables, series on um, irrigation, series on maybe different things. So you might need to check on the structure of the text. You might need to check whether you can include graphics photographs and whether you can use color. So you need to know some of those things. What is the requirement of that particular series of publication? But if not, most policy briefs, you're allowed to put graphs, graphics. It catches, you can see that I sh uh, I, in my previous presentation, which you're gonna have this presentation at the end, I'm trying to 
uh, flesh it up and put uh, some references at the back to show uh, uh, some documents you can read later for further readings. So, uh, there you're allowed to put graphics. Then you have key messages. We're talking about that in your executive summary. So you need to ask for those requirements. You also need to check the type and level of language to use, and manuscripts submission and, and um, editing requirements. Sometimes for organization commission policy briefs, that is part of a series, you might need that. Now, <coughs> we're coming to a very, very important aspect of um, uh, Moodle. I call it structural frames of policy briefs. I use the word structural frame because that caught my attention because of my background, <laughs> you know. And um, what about structural frames? You have a building like this, you have your column, you have a beam, you have your slab and all that. So it is after you have your frame, you begin to put your blocks, you put your roof, you put your tiles, you put everything, then it becomes a building. But without your structural frames, you can't have a building. So in the same way, in the structural frames for your policy brief, or structural elements, if you call it like that, call it structural elements, what are the things that you put together to constitute your policy brief? Number one, the title of the policy brief. That's too critical. The title will determine whether anybody will read it at all. Just like we were talking the other time, though um, a friend is still asking me to think of another word to use for, oh, is this someone was asking me another word for corruption? Is, is it okay? <laughs> and I'm still thinking. <laughs> I have not come to that. People will think that overnight. So another word you can use. So you need to look at synonyms, you know. <laughs> what are better ways to present your topic that will be catchy? We'll be talking about that, you know. That will catch the attention of a reader. It just get this policy brief, it just couldn't wait, couldn't do anything until he has finished reading the whole page. But if it's not attractive to him, sorry, he's not going to read it further. So that is the package and the outside of it. That's the first thing he's saying. Just like the title of your research paper, but policy brief is even more complicated because your research paper, if somebody, an academician, if he gets in contact with your paper, he will possibly want to read it because general academician is a reader. <laughs> he can read, even if it's not too interesting. He just wants to dig in to the content. But a policymaker has no reason <laughs> to read your policy brief. You know, it's a government official. He can, he can take several decisions in intuition. You know intuition? You just stay there and, and, and depend on some, some things out there. You just... Intuition, where you take decision without any rationale, no, no, no basis for it. You just say, some people say, okay, I know in my knower. Some people say that I just know inside that this is what I should do. You know, it's not based on any evidence. It's not based on any thinking, no rational thinking. So some policymakers do that. But, but if you have your title that is captivating, they will do that. And two, executive summary. That's also very important. We'll be looking at that very deeply. Uh, we'll be looking at uh, the highlights, whether you use highlights or you use key messages and all that. Then context and importance of the problem. That's another structural frame. And then possibly today, we have a flip chart all over this place, and then we'll possibly put ourselves into groups. Uh, maybe climate change group will be in a place. Uh, inclusive finance, I think a large part of us are in inclusive finance, am I correct in the... But I know that those connected virtually, uh, there are a couple of, uh, here we have um, inclusive finance, uh, almost about 10 or 11. So inclusive finance will possibly gather around a place, maybe like there. You craft your title, you paste it there, maybe we'll give you 15 minutes to do that. Then we'll go around with you and uh, your colleagues will be there. That's a practical exercise. And then uh, maybe we have inclusive finance somewhere, climate change somewhere, and maybe um, COVID, if we have there, we ask virtually in another place. I will possibly stay with one, Dr. Ojo will stay with other people, help you to, or facilitate to help you craft your policy brief proposal to make it catchy, to make it attractive, to make policymaker want to 
read it, to catch it and say, look, we can't stop until I finish this whole page, despite the fact that I had no time. So today, we, possibly, I hope we can have time. We have one hour for the practical exercise, the title of the policy brief, an executive summary. If you can do that today, we'll be very happy we have made a good progress. And maybe tomorrow, we'll possibly look at the context and importance of the problem. And that's also very important. We've said that before. You must provide reason why there's an urgent, urgent, that they need to take an urgent decision. The context, for example, you're talking of COVID. Everybody knows, maybe in 2019, 2020, COVID is so bad. <laughs> so you're providing policy brief on that. Everybody wants to, because it's so urgent. But 2022, I don't know. Maybe some people say, oh, it's not as bad as it used to be in 2019. Many countries are relaxing and all that. So the kind of catching topic you produce in 2019 and 2020 will possibly differ now. When everybody's locked down in 2019, 2020, topics you provide, people want to catch it, but now they possibly have other things disturbing them and the policymakers. So we want to look at maybe tomorrow, look at context and importance of the problem. We want to help you refine what you have done or what you are doing and say, look, this context, why don't you use this kind of context? And that's very important because we'll be helping you to shape in that from uh, development experience, you know, based on, for example, in the area of climate change, uh, I think I have quite some understanding of that domain. I know what is current policy debate. I know that. And I know what uh, is which of the SDGs are connected to that. Uh, what are the indicators that we're looking at? The African Union agenda, I know how that is connected. And um, I'll be able to support, and Dr. Ojo has quite some experience in the area of COVID-19, and um, we'll jointly share uh, inclusive uh, finance. I have some, quite some experience in that place. I will work in the development finance space, and having my second doctorate degree in development finance, I think I have some understanding of that. And um, so results and implication. Uh, we'll be looking at under results and implications, there's something called summary of the evidence, which uh, in your research, you will call it conclusion of your research. But this is not talking of conclusion of research. We put the context there, what is the evidence that you have put together after you have done this um, great analysis, you've used um, uh, your software, Stata, uh, Limdep, I know Limdep is old, you use your SPSS, structural equation, computable general equilibrium, all these softwares that you're excited to use, you know, at the end of it. Or you even do qualitative research. Some do qualitative, it's equally good, you know, and some do mixed method research, qualitative, quantitative, mixed method. You've done several things, different variables, and um, you've done control group, non-control, all kinds of things you've done. What is the summary of the evidence? that you have for policymaker, we we'll look at that. Then critique of your policy options or policy implication. We talked about advocacy and objective policy brief. Please don't forget that at the start of writing your policy brief, you need to decide whether you're doing advocacy policy brief. That's the first thing you need to do, please. Whether you're doing advocacy policy brief or you're doing objective policy brief. That will determine what your topic will be. That will determine what the framing of your topic will be. So after that, we'll look at your policy recommendations. And then that's another structural frame. Then appendices, if necessary. Uh, sources consulted or recommended. That's what we're talking about here. References or bibliography. Honestly speaking, we'll think that, I would think that, I know the references is required in a policy brief. Maybe you want to just put some, one or two suggestions for further readings, you know. Interestingly, there are some policymakers who have academic experience. You know, for me, when I was, in that space, especially in the in African context, in the regional economic community, regional development finance institution, I can read, you know, as an advisor, I read research articles, I read policy brief, I do some, so it's not a problem for me. But if you have somebody who doesn't have academic mindset, and is an advisor to the president, advisor to minister, it, it wouldn't read them, it wouldn't interest him. 
Some of the things that will interest you as academician will not interest. Some is an advisor and uh, maybe is just maybe even a politician. Sometimes <laughs> your politician coming to put as an advisor. So it won't be interested in all these your sources cited. So Yes, <clears throat> title of policy briefs. Sorry, I think Dr. Ojo will have to take over at um, 2.40. And um, our time is choked up, but I will try to run through this in the next 18 minutes so that I can come, so that we have some foundation for the work that we are going to do uh, in the evening. And if time permits, I will still complete this because it's also very important, but let's run through some basic elements so that we can do the work we're doing. Title of the policy brief. One, the title must be short. <laughs> very short, not the long one. Uh, COVID-19 uh, impact in Zimbabwe, computable general equilibrium model. No, 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 no. <laughs> that is not the topic. <laughs> Maybe that is good for the Af <laughs> academic, but that's not, they're not interested computed general equilibrium or systematic review of literatures. No, they, nobody's interested in that kind of thing. So, but the short, informative, and catchy. Catchy. And in the case of um, sensitive topics, maybe sometimes diplomatic, <laughs> not, um, not um, 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 advocating for the use of coal fire plants and saying that, um, after all, the developed countries they develop, and after they have developed, they don't want us to develop, and then now they're asking us to go, nobody will read your paper, because that's not on the African Union agenda. That's not on <laughs> UNFCCC, it's not on global debate. You're backwards. <laughs> 20 years ago, you are too back. Nobody will read such things, because that is not the way the developing practitioners is thinking. People are thinking how to increase percentage of renewables in your energy mix. They are thinking of advanced, Technology. They are thinking of uh, uh, um, um, uh, gas capture and, and, and storage. You know how you can even solve the problem of coal uh, fire plant. You know, so they are thinking of some better things. Not that you are telling them they have to revert. Nobody will read that. It's not uh, catchy. The title should aim to catch the attention of the reader and compel him or her to read on so that. So that needs to be descriptive, punchy, and relevant. So your policy brief actually starts here. If you can't get, if you don't get it in title, then please, sorry. And you, you, you mix a lot, a lot. So we're going to spend quite some time today looking at the title of our policy briefs during the group discussion, during the group exercise, four to five. We're going to spend quite some time on that. If you can do that, then that will be quite good. Title of policy brief. The title should be short, chatty, uh, catchy, and to the point, which is further described as the word short means try to keep it not less than 12 words. Think about what 12 words can do. If that is not possible, consider breaking it into a title and subtitle. So, but better, let your title be not more than 12 words. If it can be less, better. Because if it's more, the policy lose track of what you're talking about. As a matter of fact, as a researcher, I'm sure you understand that part of the things we're trained in research is that, especially if you have earned a PhD, your advisor will tell you, you can't put everything you have done in your paper into topic. You know, keep your reader in suspense. You know, they want to, there's something that they are looking forward in the topic they have not seen. So make it short. Let them... Put them, let them be curious. Let them want to read uh, your document, your, your, your policy brief. It should be catchy. It should grab the reader's attention. Try to include relevant keywords. As a matter of fact, <coughs> when I've done policy briefs, I try to <coughs> see if I can put part of the global debate on it. For example, if you know what is global continental agenda, on climate change or inclusive finance, I want it to be there, you know.
For example, Africa, you know, has Agenda 2053, uh, African Power Vision, African Water Vision, uh, UNFCCC, what they're doing, inclusive uh, finance, UNCDF, you know, and um, look at different things they're doing. Or look at SDGs. You know, there are 17 SDGs. I'm sure we are aware of them. How many of us know SDGs? 17 SDGs. Oh, excellent. So look at things like that. You know, if I read something, I can see something connected to the SDGs. I'm interested. I want to see. If I see something con connected to, you know, African Union agenda, I'm interested. I want to see. If I see something connected to what is a priority of the regional economic communities, I want to see it. It's catchy for me. So we want it to be like that. You know, if you grab the attention of the, try to include key relevant words, uh, find an unusual turn of phrase that sticks in the mind. Things that you won't be able to go. Also, yes, please. Yeah, you mentioned that for your policy, be, it should be very short in title and cashy. Yes. So I want to know whether your article that has been published that we use can be different from that of the policy brief. Yes, Should I repeat? I think it's loud. I'm struggling to. Hello? Hello. Oh, it's, it's loud. Uh, I'm struggling Hello. to hear. I'm yes. saying that your article or your published article title, can it be distinct from that of the policy brief title? Because you say it should be short and cashy. And yes, most often, a... you observe that you, if you see a journal article, maybe you have a long title as compared to the policy brief title. Can it be different? Exactly, you have answered the question, and that's what Dr. Ojo has uh, nodded. It okay. can be different, because you can put your research uh, article and uh, put a title there. I know research article, I've seen a couple of your, <laughs> I've read, I've not read all of them. The one in, um, some of them are written in French. <laughs> and uh, my French is not, it's not too, too, it's not, maybe it's not grid A. I've lived in a francophone country before for five years. Well, unfortunately, I didn't, I didn't speak to good French. So I cannot read it. I'm trying to translate it. Yes. I think at times some of the problems we <coughs> have is that um, when we're doing the research, we're addressing a number of key questions at the same time. So we come up with a number of recommendations. But when we get to policy brief, we want to put everything Thank there. you very much. That's the problem. And that makes it too clumsy. And I think that might be where his issue is coming from. Thank you. Where he sees this title that is capturing all the, 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 the objectives that he has been addressing. And we think all has to go to the policy Exactly. Brief. Maybe you can even break them to four or five policy briefs. You can briefs. have uh, like two or three other po yeah, three policy, briefs. policy briefs. Yes. But you don't have or to focus put everything. Yes, thank you. That's focus on the most relevant question that might be catchy. You leave the rest for, for later. Yes. So you mean that from one paper you can get two or three policy briefs on it? From one paper? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So to the point, it should also be relevant to be topic. If you say that to the point, that means your policy brief should, in a sense, be relevant to, be, to the topic we are talking about. Now, executive summary of the policy brief. I'm, I'm, I'm trusting that today, We'll have time to dig into these two. That's um, the title and executive summary uh, of the policy briefs. Maybe when I finish this, I will have to stop for Dr. Ujo to come and take over. And uh, maybe tomorrow, before I start um, module four, I'll go through this so that we can have hands-on information to be able to do the exercise tomorrow. But let's see how far we go with this. Uh, this could be a summary of the policy brief or it could be both highlights and headings. I have to explain that. Because if you want your executive summary to be catchy, you could actually have some highlights, like key messages. I think the next slide will show that, like Dr. Ayorinde said, that you can have like three. Normally, you do three key messages in policy brief. Most policymakers will possibly stop at your key messages. Some of them would not even dig deeper, you know. That even when they're interested in it. So you can have, number one, a summary of your policy brief. Or you can have highlights, like key messages, and look for a way. Maybe if you can incorporate the topic of your thesis, of your, of your, 
uh, research or the, what we are distilling into it. Two, however, include the headings of your policy brief as proven from my experience, from the experience of other practitioners, I've shown that it's more effective to quickly convince policymakers, given how little time they spend reading a policy brief. Most policymakers will possibly spend not more than 10 minutes on your policy brief if they have the time. You know. So let's uh, look at how we can craft a summary in a way, slotting your headings that you have put there as a title and try to put the highlight. Presenting a summary of the key messages, that's also very important, on the first page ensures that the reader will at least become aware of the brief's content and want to continue reading. Once you get it right in the area of your title, you have your key messages, you got it right, slotting your head in, inside, and if you can attract and catch the policymaker, if you can reach that, if it's attractive to him, he will possibly want to dig deeper, he will want to know more about what you have written. Yeah, let me just put in an um, exact summary of the policy brief. Number one, listen to this very carefully. The highlights you usually encapsulate in a box. You are allowed in policy brief to create small boxes. Uh, and we'll possibly be looking at that when we are designing templates. What the templates should look like, that's a module four and um, designed in a box, presented in a bullet uh, point form. You can actually use a bullet point form. You know, I've shown four examples of policy brief, and though I couldn't see it clearly, but you can see it on the photo the other time, in different forms. So you can study three key messages, three to five key messages developed in the policy brief. The summary is intended to capture the attention and arouse the interest of the readers. You know, the first thing you want to, you want to catch, you want to captivate as a marketer. What are the key words? What are the key things? You're marketing your company. What are the key things? Otherwise, you know, somebody, I met somebody in the airport, he said, okay, we're building apartment <laughs> in Dubai, 10-story building, and um, I want you to buy a single room there for $150,000. I just walk away because what you have said is, it doesn't make meaning to me. You have a 19 story apartment in Dubai, and you want me to buy a single room for $150,000. And, uh, and after that, you say, yes, we'll be obtaining, uh, when, they are, uh, when uh, clients are coming, they take the room, we'll be paying you the, the, the room rate. He has lost it from the onset. <laughs> you know, there are better ways to package that. You know, you threw me off. So the same way, you're selling this, if you're, for him, the three key messages gave me, put me off. Nice story, nice story building in Dubai. I only have one room. Hey, what are you talking about? <laughs> $150,000 can buy you a whole property in some countries. <laughs> so that's not the first thing to tell me, you know. And I'm, I put off, I didn't even listen anymore. So the same way it has to capture. The executive summary aims to convince the reader further that the brief work in-depth investigation. Those are what this does. It is especially important for an audience that is short of time. We've talked about it extensively in the morning that policymakers have no such time to see the relevance and importance of the brief in reading them. As such, one to two paragraph executive summary, it's adequate. One to two paragraphs. And that's why it's going to be very simple for us to do it uh, right in the, at 4 p.m. One to two paragraph, you can take the marker, write it there, we go through, we read, we tell you, come on, what you have written is not going to sell. Just like um, I mentioned to you, somebody, we have that history apartment, yes, yeah, number two, um, you can get a room, number three, you pay 150, I'm rushing to cash my flight, and you think I will stay <laughs> to be listening to you? The three things you said, they put me off, I don't have the time, I have flight at one hour, in the next one hour. So, if he has presented it in a better way, I will possibly spare 10 minutes. Remember, I don't have time. I don't want to miss my flight. The same way a policymaker don't have time to read. <laughs> he has tons of things that are disturbing him. You know. So, number as such, one to two paragraph as a summary, commonly include one, description of the problem, don't forget. 
a statement why the current approach policy option needs to be changed, you must present a compelling evidence that, look, the current status is not the way to go. And you are literally asking the policymaker to have a paradigm shift. And that's not an easy thing. <laughs> if somebody has believed this for a very long time, this is the way it's been done. Somebody is doing uh, fossil fuel, and you want to convert him. <laughs> you want him to be a disciple of renewables. <laughs> so, and he has been that for a long time. So, you need to do a lot of work to have an approach uh, that needs to be changed. And after presenting that, you have to say there is a better approach, better way to do it, and um, your recommendation for action. So, this is extremely important. I remember the last time we did. Um, policy brief, I think, and improve cooked stove. And um, people are used to cooking using charcoal. And then um, you're trying to change them to use gas. You can't change them. Most, most of them, when you dissolve it, they say, look, when you cook with charcoal, it's sweeter. How can you explain that? It is him who knows it's sweeter. <laughs> no, there's no way you can convince him. It is his thinking. I want you to change his paradigm and say, okay, using gas is much better. It will tell you gas is not as sweet as the other one. So you need to know how to sell this appropriately. And your recommendation for action is also quite paramount. So these are the key things we are looking at today. Your topic, your executive summary, and these are key things we want to see when we are doing the exercises. Digest this one, please, and um, put it in your mind. As we are going around in the evening, trying to gather in groups to write our executive summary, getting a uh, title together. So let's get all this together so that by the end of today, our deliverable is that we're able to write topic that is sharp and catchy. Two, executive summary of the policy brief that somebody trying to catch a plane, you stop him. <laughs> Buy a house in Dubai and want to take some risk, 10, 15 minutes, to listen to you in terms of policy brief, if you compare that together. And I think by tomorrow, uh, I will try to slot in some time to do some more. Uh, we still have a couple of things we want to address there. We're also looking at understanding policy processes, policymakers, and the role of public policy. But the beauty of it is that we can try to create some time and then um, to look at that also. Uh, but in the meantime, I'll call um, Dr. Ujo uh, to look at um, understanding of the role of social media. It's also very critical in communicating research and how to engage social media. I think it has one hour, if I'm correct, to do that. We have health break, and we'll start our exercise. Remember, please, uh, we're going to do the exercise on the title of your policy brief and also on the executive summary. Dr. Ujo has quite some experience in this area in terms of social media. He has done that extensively. Thank you. So, colleagues, thanks so very much. Uh, can we give Professor Adelego a round of applause? So, will you be kind to help me put on the paper four for today? Yes, paper four. Yes. We will actually merge paper three tomorrow. Yes, who we'll, we'll make paper three. Because of the hands-on experience that has to be taken out. Yeah, thank you very much. So, and um, just get ready the slide as well. So my name is Emmanuel Ojo. I work at Vich University. And um, if you don't mind, permit me to take off my jacket because it's getting hotter in here. Yeah, I don't know if you're feeling hot. So, thanks. So, um, Today's session will basically look at the role of social media in science communication. So, initially I planned 90 minutes, but because of the time that we have, I will actually do the presentation in just about one hour. 
And what I want to do, and please at any point in time feel free to stop me, I will try to stand there. I, I like moving back and forth, but because of the audience, um, I think it would be better to just try and stand still and, and try and speak to exactly what I want to do. So this session is, you won't sit still, I can assure you. Um, you have to move around a bit. And I will tell you exactly why you have to move around. So there are about four sections that I actually want to look at, as you can see on the, on the slide. And the last part of this session is a case study. And I will share with you practical case study of how to use social media to actually disseminate your work. And, you know, one thing you have to keep in mind, especially with respect to being a researcher, is that the audience you write a paper for is not the same audience you write a policy brief for. They are two different audiences. If that's the only thing you can remember, please keep that in mind. I will say it again. It's a totally different audience that you are writing a policy brief for. Totally different. And as long as you understand that, you will not approach writing a policy brief the same way you at actually attempt to address a paper. So it's really, very it is really very important for us to have that understanding. So, my brother, I want the slide to help now. So, I told you we are going to move around, okay? Yes, awesome. So, this part, you will need to stand up and scan that QR code with your phone. Um, if you can scan, you can as well go to slido.com, enter today's date, is, today is the 3rd of 03050022. So I need you to please try and log in there, and I will tell you exactly what I want us to do. So. So, you will get the first question now on the screen. Okay. Yeah, it's, don't worry, you can scan. You can still scan, it's fine. You've not lost it. So, if you scan the QR code, the first question asks, when you hear about the phrase social media, what is the first word or phrase that easily comes to your mind? So, if you scan the QR code right on your phone, you'll be able to answer in real time and we will be able to witness the, your response in real time. And the good thing about this is that it's anonymous. Um, no one knows who is actually, I don't know if it's Nicholas typing or Emmanuel. Just put in your re response and then we'll get it. So what is the first thing that comes to your mind? So you can type in the box. Okay, I see social media platforms, thank you. Someone has responded. Um, what tells readily comes to your mind? Uh, when you think of social media, what readily comes to your mind? One word or one phrase? If you can get the QR, uh, QR code scanned, you can also go to slido.com. Thank you. Twitter, Facebook, hashtag, online communication, Facebook and Twitter. Thank you. What else readily comes to your mind? So I'm getting some nice responses, and I'm really very happy about this. So there are five responses so far, which I'm really happy with. OK, Facebook and Twitter is suddenly becoming bigger, OK? That means more and more of you are actually thinking of these as Facebook and social media. OK, interesting. I like this. What else? OK, can you see someone is saying influence, LinkedIn, socializing, you know, TikTok, I like this. I like this group. This is a fantastic group. I'm seeing TikTok, I'm seeing Twitter, I'm seeing casual space. Casual space, you see, I'm seeing influence, I'm seeing LinkedIn, Facebook. So LinkedIn has suddenly become bigger. Can you see? So there is LinkedIn, there is Facebook, there is Twitter, okay? What else? What else really comes to your mind? What else? Twelve of us has responded so far, and I'm sure people also online, they're able to respond in real time. 
What else? So I see social way of communicating. Brilliant. Okay, thank you. That's the next question. Now, the next question is asking you, which of these social media sites do you use regularly? So there is Facebook. You can click more than one that you use regularly. Um, and you will see all the things in there. There is Facebook, there is Twitter, there is LinkedIn, there is Instagram. Okay, I see people saying Twitter, YouTube. Suddenly, WhatsApp is becoming bigger. In real time, we'll get the responses. And in real time, this response actually and is anonymous. Is we're able to at least see exactly what we think from an aggregate perspective. He's not actually looking at someone. We are getting a feel of what exactly. So more of us, most of us are saying we look at WhatsApp. Brilliant. I'm not surprised. LinkedIn and also YouTube. So I'm not surprised that as researchers, we use more of WhatsApp. Than, than YouTube or maybe TikTok. I'm not surprised. So that means we're in, this, in the right room. Okay? So most people are saying WhatsApp. Okay? I, I can see most of us are not actually using Instagram. And so far we have 10 responses. Okay? Let's get, let's get some more responses, including people online. Okay? It's changing now gradually. WhatsApp is still leading in real time. Oh, suddenly now LinkedIn is leading, okay, which is interesting, okay, which is nice because it speaks to the ethos of exactly what we do as researchers. So LinkedIn suddenly has increased. So we now have LinkedIn leading, followed by WhatsApp and followed by YouTube. And I won't be surprised with us using YouTube, especially because of the way you can easily learn a lot now on YouTube. Coding, running, regression analysis, all of that you can use on YouTube. On YouTube, Brilliant. What is fascinating is where most of us are sitting with Twitter. It is really interesting, and I will, I will speak to that. Okay? Twitter is suddenly moving up now, okay? and we have 15 responses so far. In this part, this will be the, the next question will be the last question. There are five questions. I have three at the beginning and two at the end. Okay? So, for this session, this is the last part. How important do you think social media is as a research communication tool? Do you think it's very important? Do you think it's somehow important? Or do you think oh, it's not important at all? I mean, this is a waste of time. What am I, is for kids, you know? What am I doing there? Okay? So feel free. I hope you are voting. And remember, we need this data. And you can see that I've also used social media to collect the data. Okay? No, no, no. Your privacy, I will show you how to protect your privacy. <laughs> So your, your, your privacy is not really the issue. How you use it is the issue, and I will show you. <laughs> so interestingly, most of us are actually considering that social media is, is very important. And this, for me, is extremely powerful. So let's go back to the first question. Most of you see Facebook and Twitter, OK, as what readily comes to your mind when you think of social media platforms? Most of you are saying you, look, you use LinkedIn more than any of the other platforms. Even though what readily comes to your mind is Facebook and Twitter, most of you don't even use the two. Can you see? You don't use the two. Instead, you use LinkedIn. And if you observe, and I will not necessarily go there. The use of LinkedIn itself is intentional. Okay? Not necessarily to communicate your research, but possibly to find opportunities. Can you see? Does that make sense? Okay. And the third one, most of you are saying the use of social media is really very important. You didn't say important. You say very important. So if I were to add important and very important, 81% of you are actually considering the use of social media as really very powerful. 
So do me a favor, give yourself a round of applause. <laughs> so can you move back to this slide, please? Thanks, my brother. I appreciate you. So what I want to do today, yeah, thank you very much. So what I want to do today, remember I said it's in four parts, and I will try to finish it within an hour. Um, there are two more questions I will ask at the end of the session. And they are very easy peasy, they are very easy questions. So the first thing is what exactly is social media? And what exactly is its role in research communication? So remember most of you are saying your understanding of social media is Facebook and Twitter. But interestingly, the polls show that you use more of LinkedIn than what you think social media is. Okay. So, <clears throat> my definition, you know, when we were putting heads together for this session, what we said was that we are not going to come and bombard you with theoretical insights. We'll give you some theoretical meat just to lay the foundation, but for us it was more reflective to engage you at a practitioner level. Okay? Practitioner level because we also want what exactly will be working on with you to make more meaning and to be usable for you going forward. With the amount of data in our world, one thing you have to understand is that it is important, and I mean really very important, to think of social media very differently. So this is exactly my definition of social media. It is a network that never sleeps. It is powered by the internet. We produce in finite amount of data, voluntarily, and we share it. So my brother, your talk about privacy is as good as it is, we voluntarily actually give our data to social media, including WhatsApp. Even though we know we use it, okay? And if you observe, can you see how many people uh, social media users in the world, 4.62 billion as of January this year. And this is 58.4% of the entire world. Do you think that is a kind of space you would take for granted? No. No, it is not. And this is exactly what this session is about. So, I am saying whether consciously or unconsciously, as long as you have a cell phone, you are daily interacting with social media. Either you call yourself an addict or a mild user, the reality is that you can't live without it. <laughs> so, if you think of it as a researcher, do you think that is a space you should ignore? Do you, it's not. It's not. And because it's not a space you should ignore, you need to understand that the social media has impact on you the same way you have impact on social media. I, want, I will flip a couple of slides which are images, and I need you to pay attention. Um, can you give me a moving mic, please? Please, if you can, I will really appreciate that. Um, and I will tell you why. But I promise you I will come back to the podium. I promise you. Thank you. I won't give you too much work, especially the cameraman. I will be very conscious of you being here. But I, I just need, I need to speak to some of this data on the screen. Thank you, sir. So. So. Um, hello, can you hear me? Okay, is it good? So if you look at this data, look at the internet adoption as at April this year. So this is a global report. And this global report is a report I want us to think about. And I want us to have a sense of, of how much data we are actually chunking out. So this is internet adoption. Observe where we are in Africa. And observe the comparison across different countries and different regions. Okay? Can you see that? 
across Africa, where do we have the highest internet adoption? Where? Southern Africa. Can you see that? Okay. Good. Next. If you look at the favorite social media platforms at January 2022, which one has the highest? WhatsApp. Can you see? WhatsApp. Who doesn't have a WhatsApp account here? Okay, no one. Can you see? So, that actually has the highest. In terms of our use of social media globally, as of April 2022, observe where we are. Average daily time spent using social media is two hours, technically 30 minutes. Every day. Okay? So, social media users versus the population age, 13 plus. Can you observe that? Do you observe a um, year-on-year change in social media use? Every year, we are adding 326 million people. Okay? Can you see that? Do you think this is a space you should ignore? Okay. So? Time spent on social media apps. The highest time was spent on YouTube. Can you see? The least time was spent on both Facebook Messenger and Snapchat. People are listening more to music on TikTok and looking at all kinds of things. Look at time spent on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. So, YouTube, followed by Facebook and TikTok is sharing the same. And remember, TikTok came only after Facebook. Okay? Keep in mind. Now, so, knowing this data, again, do you think this is a space you should ignore? It's not. So, even as a researcher, you need to understand that there is something... There is something social media does that is beyond what you should or we should ignore as, as researchers. Any question? Are you convinced of the use of social media? Do you think it's a space to be in? Happy? Okay. So, so, so the next question is, what value does social media provide for researchers? So what value? Why should you really bother about this? What value? And the argument I'm making, based on the re reference at the bottom of that slide, is that when it comes to identification of knowledge, the creation of knowledge, the quality assurance of knowledge, as well as the dissemination of knowledge, you need to pay attention to social media as a researcher. And I will tell you practical ways you can use social media, not just to disseminate your research, but to also promote your own research. Okay? In terms of social media tools, this particular paper, I find it extremely powerful in terms of how to use social media to communicate research findings. Okay? Don't worry. At the end of this session, you'll be able to download this presentation in real time using social media just by scanning a QR code and you will download it. Okay? So, Let's look at social media basics for researchers. So this is the second part. You can see we are moving. OK? Remember I told you there are four parts. So this is the second part. So what exactly are social media basics you need to pay attention to? Either you believe in social media or not, there are some basic things you must do to help you be a better user of social media, especially as a researcher. Okay, 
This will not be so clear, but don't worry, you'll be able to download it. But something I really wanted to pay attention to here, especially with this particular slide, is not that sharp, um, but it's fine, is the fact that you need to understand that your presence on social media as a researcher is something you cannot easily take off. Let me say that again. Your presence on social media as a researcher is not something you can easily take off when you're there. Even if you delete a tweet, okay, your digital footprint has already been created. So the summary of one, two, and three is that as a researcher, be conscious and be carefully conscious in the way you use social media. Can I say that again? How many of you know the president that, was, that had to resign from being the president because he plagiarized? Do you know that president? Which president was that? A whole president plagiarized his PhD. And because he plagiarized, he had to resign. It happened in our lifetime. Who remember that president? Okay, I won't tell you. Find out. And I will check tomorrow. A president resigned. Okay? Because, because, <laughs> because he plagiarized a PhD. And they were able to find him out through social media. Okay? So, th third part. Can you see we are moving? Are you happy? 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 If you are happy, smile. Don't look too serious. Okay, good. And f remember, you can stop me and ask questions at any time. Okay? So, what really is happening is, when it comes to social media as a researcher, there are certain strategies you must use for you to use social media well. And when you pay attention to the use of those strategies, you will not just be the one using social media. Social media will work for you. Okay? And there are just six strategies I have. Just six. No more than six. Open sesame. Okay? So, the first two strategies is to create a professional brand. And the second one is identify the platform that works for you. And one of the things I will do in this session is I will give you a case, I will give you case studies. And the case studies I've decided, and, is, and what I will show you is not to is not to brag, but I want to show you how I have used social media, not just to build my research brand, but also to disseminate my research findings. Okay? And I will show you what has happened within the past three to six weeks by using social media, okay? in terms of my own research. Remember, I'm a researcher, okay? And all of us here, we have that in common, including Professor Adelego, because he's still a researcher, okay? So we are all researchers, okay? So it is important for you to create a professional, a professional brand. Do you observe that all of us are seated here and looking very professional, okay? We are dressed for the context. Okay? Does that make sense? Even my dear sister from Bene Republic, who is wearing the native, can you see how beautifully she looks? She is dressed professionally. Look at my brother from Ghana. He's putting a native on top of that. He is dressed professionally. Huh? 
Same thing for my brother from Gambia. Uh, Burkina Faso and France, I remember. Look at the way he's dressed. He's dressed prof in the same way. When it comes to social media, be very professional. Don't just copy and paste a photograph there that will not make you look good. Rather, think professional. Then the other thing is, choose the best platform. And I will show you exactly what to choose. Okay? Okay. The third and fourth is take the time to properly set up your profile. Don't set up your profile in a hurry. Okay? And when you are sharing your research, especially your papers, use the DOI number. You know, I'm sure you know the DOIs. Use the DOIs. Because the DOIs will directly link to where? To the paper, to the journal. Okay? So, two other things you must do, especially when you are using social media. Either you are recruiting participants for your research or you are trying to disseminate your research. It is important that you understand the guidelines. Don't do anything unethical, especially as a researcher on social media. It could come back to haunt you for life. Can I say that again? When you are recruiting participants, and I must say this because we are all researchers, don't recruit participants online you don't have ethics clearance for. Make sure that the ethics clearance is in place before you go online to say, please come participate in my research. Because someone could suddenly say, oh, you want me to participate in this? Research? I know it's an online questionnaire, but do you have ethics clearance for it? If you do, can you send it to me? And then, then you suddenly realize, oh, I didn't realize they will ask for ethics. And if you cannot produce it, people can flag it out and say, oh, um, this person is collecting data on financial inclusion across Africa using a WhatsApp link, and there is no ethics clearance. And that can come back to haunt you. Yes. You're speaking as though, I, I don't know, you have to gauge whether the countries we come from really think of ethics clearance, first of all, seriously, because you're not the one who, so, who is supposed to produce your own ethical clearance. You have to apply, and there's a process. And I know that so many countries in Africa might not think of ethical clearance. Some people, you'll be surprised, might not even know where do I get an ethical clearance as a researcher in my country. So perhaps it's something we, we have to go deep into it. I know of a top scholar, Cameroonian, he was at UCT. He published something, a very groundbreaking work, but because of ethical concerns, he had to leave UCT and leave South Africa. Yeah. And it's something that is coming across the rest of Africa. Yep. And you might think, you might actually be sitting in a country where they don't take, take ethical clearance seriously. You do your work. But by the time you want to go beyond the boundaries of your work, you hit, you hit roadblock because of lack of ethical clearance. And it's not ARC that is supposed to tell you to, to have an ethical clearance. It's you as a researcher. Absolutely. To be honest with you, what he has said is so powerful. And I will share with you a personal experience. Um, I'm running it anyway. Maybe I shouldn't talk more about that now. But let me come back to that specifically in the global, in the case study I will share with you. The, there, is a, there is a global project I was chatting with him. I mean, myself and Nicholas were on the same flight coming back, uh, coming from South Africa yesterday. And we're having a very informal chat about one of the global projects I run. And currently, there are 25 universities across five continents. And I will speak to it as a, as a case study. I had to drop researchers from certain countries in Africa because of ethical clearance. It was very painful for me. But I had to because I will not want them to be part of the project if there is no ethics clearance. I have people working in South America on the project. We have ethics clearance in Portuguese. I don't understand Portuguese. 
We have a test clearance in Spanish. I don't speak Spanish. Okay? And it was only after they did the ethics clearance that we could move on with the project. So, E is absolutely spot on that the issue of ethics clearance is big. And I will speak to that in, in terms of the case study. So, the th sixth strategy is stay active. Okay? Don't do a one soft thing. You open a Twitter account in 2023, in 2019, and you've only done one post since 2019. Don't. It will come back to haunt you. Okay? It will come back to haunt you. Any question? Yes. Yeah, thank you for the wonderful insight so far. So my question is, uh, of course, as maybe researchers, we normally have the professional life and also the social life. And this also tra translates to our choice of maybe social media platforms, where at times we consider LinkedIn as the more professional social media platform and aspects like Facebook as the more social. So you have the tendency to post professional uh, aspects of your life on LinkedIn, but uh, the more social and uh, the more social aspects on, let's say, Facebook. But you've mentioned that there's need to ensure professionalism in our, uh, let's say, accounts, let's say, in, uh, in our usability of the social media platform. Because at times, what you post make in one platform may come and haunt you in, a, in multiple perspectives. So how do, does one go about that where they need, need to manage the professional? aspects and the social aspects based on social media. Absolutely. My advice, if you want to stay an active researcher, and remember as a researcher, he used to be an academic that turned into a global practitioner in international development. Okay? His previous life as an academic, if it was not clean, will come back to haunt him in this role. So when it comes to social media, don't separate your professional life and your social life. Have one life and stick to it. Can I say that again? Okay. Let me repeat what I've just said. When it comes to the use of social media, don't have, even don't try to have a pseudonym account that does not look like you. You could put an avatar there. I can tell you it will come back to limb back to you. Okay? One part of social media or the use of the internet I've, I worked on extensively is the use of blockchain. I am very, very vast in the use of it. Believe it or not, in today's world of Web 3.0, there is nothing you have done that is secret. If today you become, where are you from, sir? Kenya, good. Tomorrow you might become the governor of the Central Bank of Kenya. And somebody feels, Ish, why should it be him? They can dig something up that you thought you tweeted about one person doing something funny. Just by, it might just be a simple comment. It could be brought back because, you see, there is nothing online that is gone. It is archived. So someone can call it back for you. Even if you are hungry, don't vent it on social media. Let me tell you, I don't know if you are aware that the American High Commission, the American Embassy, when they, they go check your social media platforms before they give you visas. Are, are you aware of that? Yeah. So they check you out. So there is no private, as I speak with you, I don't have a private life and I don't have a public life. I have one life. And I keep that one life on the straight line. I might be slow, but I'm steady. Okay? Because tomorrow, someone else might come who feels, you know, I don't like Professor Adelego. Why should it be him becoming this in the UN? Ah, okay. 
He sent me a tweet disagreeing with my paper that um, the claims I made was not aligning with his theoretical frame. In fact, I didn't, he was angry I didn't cite two of his papers. And now I want to pull it back. Believe me, those things will haunt you. So my brother, stick to one life. Or do you have a photocopy of your life? <laughs> so stick to that one. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, the, this matter of social media is very important and controversial. As the world is evolving, we are coming to understand that that idea that we thought our lives were secret is just an illusion. And so um, my, my thought is that if you are not ready to go on social media, hold on first. But if you step into social media, although you don't keep history of your life, it will keep history of your life for you and not, uh, uh, you, the, the history will be kept not for you, for, some, for something else. Because you delete, but the record will still be there. There's a judge that they, inter they were interviewing judges recently in South Africa, uh, 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 Supreme Court judges. And uh, there was one, something was pulled concerning his record. And so they disqualified him. But something from his history, and this is happening regularly. Something you thought has moved away from your life. You don't know they're sitting somewhere with somebody. And secondly, too, um, be ready to defend your opinion. As a researcher, I think we should have a very strong opinion. That is, somebody should know you the way you are, and if they don't like you, they should leave you like that. Express your opinion with conviction. So whatever I post on social media, if they say, this thing is contrary to our value, I will still tell them it is my value. So because we, I'm thinking that I might hear this and then I get a bit uh, skeptical to say, ah, I don't want to post anything that will catch me. But if it is my conviction, I have to put it there and if people close the door on me, I know that door is not my door because I have to leave my conviction. Yeah, I'm saying this as a researcher. So that's my thinking that if I hear the, these things about social media, I might get skeptical. But at the same time, if you are not convinced about what you are selling as your research, then you yourself, you, if you are not the first buyer, who else will buy it? So we have to stand for our conviction. That is what I think uh, concerning the matter of social media. I really have, um, uh, I'm not so much a big fan in social media, but as he is sharing, so many things are being provoked in me to step in, and this is my thinking that if I'm stepping in, I have to step in with this kind of mindset, this kind of mindset, yeah. No, you're very spot on. Um, but what I want us to take from this session is to be ready to start using it from today, and I will show you some strategies, okay? This is what I want us to take away, because you see, social media, especially using certain platforms, is like writing a policy brief. And that is the argument, and you can sell the kind of things you are doing. So, I'm saying you are your own brand as a researcher. Okay? You use social media wisely to build this. You, yourself, as a researcher, you are your own brand. So you can use social media to build that brand, but you need to know how to do it right. Okay? Okay, so this is the fourth part. Remember I told you it's four parts. Happy? Are we doing well? Are you bored? No, no bottom. No, okay, no bottom. Awesome. So the fourth part is this. So a case of social media or a case of the use of social media and research communication. So everything I will show you here is my own research. And I will show you how I've used social media to grow a global research that has started right in the heart of the pandemic under strict lockdown, how that research has become global. Currently, there are 25 universities in five continents of the world. Since April 2020, I've literally had meetings with people across time zones, six time zones, 
consistently. You really will find any time I am not awake because of this project. And all grew by the use of social media. So, as I said, the, the research looks at the impact of the COVID pandemic on global universities. And the first paper out of this was published in September 2020 as part of a special call. And currently, that paper used a mixed method research. And that paper now is being cited very heavily. By just that one paper, my citation index has increased. And through this one paper, I have literally, I, I don't think there's any, every one month or second month, I am consistently speaking to different spaces. So as you can see, we have universities in South Africa, including your university. Shiri Motala works with me on it. Juliet Peruma works with me on it. Um, I'm sure you know these people. Um, they work on the project with me. The project is in Europe, in, India, in, in Asia, in South America, in North America, and it keeps growing. And that is the first paper. That first paper came out in, and can you see, the person you see there is me. Can you see I still keep a one life? Even though the glasses I'm wearing in these is different from the glasses I'm wearing now. But it's still one life. <laughs> can you see? One life, professional. And um, I don't know how many of you know Antonio Onye Ibuzi. He writes on mixed method research. That is him. Antonio Onye Ibuzi is a, professor at, is a professor at the University of Cambridge and an NRF, A rated NRF researcher in South Africa. And both of us, we have literally not slept since April 2020. We have done interviews in different spaces. And I mean, we've had meetings, tons and tons of time we put into this. OK, so I, if you can see this, I've used Twitter and ResearchGate as the first example of this project. My brother, can you put up my Twitter account now? Thank you. Can you enlarge it? Control plus, 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 plus. And enlarge the page. Can you do that? Control plus, plus, plus. Please hold on. Is my social media page. Um, this is actually my Twitter account. You can. You can add me on Twitter. I will gladly add you. And you can follow some of the things I do. On this Twitter account, can you let me scroll down, please? A little. Hello, can you? OK. OK, good. Now, this, through this one tweet, I've been able to attract quite a number of people to this project. And you can see, can you scroll down a bit and let me quickly read? Just scroll down so that we can capture everything. Um, sorry about that. Can you go back? Just back a bit. Just back a bit. We're almost there. OK, as that is happening, by just one tweet, I've been able to recruit a lot, quite a number of researchers to read my work on Twitter as well as on ResearchGate. In fact, every day I get, including this morning, 
I get reports on how many people download that paper on ResearchGate. So far, the seven paper just, the seven paper, actually the eighth paper just came out on that particular project. It, I mean, it was published on the basis of the research I'm doing with colleagues in New York, because one of the universities in New York is also involved in this particular project. Okay, don't worry, switch from Twitter, it's fine, and go back to the slide. Thank you, my brother, really appreciate you. Thank you. So, this particular slide looks at the use of conversation. The con how many of you know the conversations? How many of you read the conversation? Please, this is one place you should have an account. Conversation will build your profile as a researcher. So when the, one, of the pro, one of the universities involved in this particular project is the University of Stelling, is Stellenbosch University. In this project, there is a medical doctor amongst us, there is a nurse, there is a psychologist. These are all professionals. But we co-created the data and we did a mixed method research. And one of the things we found out from the research was that there was an increase in the incidences of mental health in the context of the pandemic on South African students. We published that and we wrote this article, which this article is like a policy brief. It's 1,850 words. Punchy, title, punchy. And do you observe the use of the image? Is a male student. And can you see the, the title? Does that title catch does the title catches you? How the pandemic is hurting university students' mental health. No stories. Direct. And believe it or not, there are about seven themes from this research, but we use one catchy one to sell the article. And what has been the impact of the article? So far, can you help me play this? Just play the link, just click on the image, it will play. Just, yeah, it will play in real time. Just click on, can you see? So I'm showing you where the article is coming. The people are reading it all over the world. Um, you can see the countries where it's being read. Can you see? And there are comments. You will be able to download this PowerPoint, so it's nothing to worry about. You will download it in real time in this session. Okay? And let me go back and then go forward again, my brother. Please, back, then go forward again. Thank you. So far, the readers have been 21,698, and I can track this in real time. In real time. And as I speak with you, through this one single article, I have been interviewed on Talk 702 FM. How many of you know this in South Africa? 702. I'm sure you know him. I got a call. I was in my, I was, and that's one that I told you about social media. I was actually sitting, after I wrote this article, the same day the article was published, my phone kept ringing. Boom, 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 boom. I'm thinking, to, I'm in meetings, what's this about? And so, hello, is this the uh, Professor Ojo? I said, yes. This is um, Talk 702. We need to interview you now. I'm like, What? See, in your article in the conversation, people were calling me from the UK, people calling me from Cape Town. I'm like, oh, what's happening? They said, no, we've read this article. It's powerful. I was running. I'm like, no, 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 I don't need this fame. He said, no, this is not fame. Your research is powerful. And suddenly I became a superstar to the point that my devotee version I said, man, no. The radio is calling us, you need to get interviewed. I'm like, you know, and I didn't look for that. Okay? So, just by writing this, which is a form of a policy brief, it changed. Because as Professor Adelaide said, they don't want to read your 10-page document. 
conversation will not take your article if it's longer than 1,005, maximum 1,800 words. It has to be punchy. It has to tell the story, and you must be able to eat it. By this one conversation article, I will tell you what else has happened. That's my university in the background, and that's me wearing a blue shirt. Okay? And you can see it looks professional. So the person you see here and here is, looks the same. And these are my other colleagues. That is Hani. That is Samantha. Samantha is a psychologist. She is a professional nurse. She is a infant psychology, and this is a medical doctor. Okay? So... The argument, I'm actually sorry about that. The argument I'm making, sorry about that, is that working on social media is like putting together a sandwich. Can you see how the sandwich is opening up and closing? You need to put the right thing inside the sandwich. And the use of social media is a process. Okay? Happy? So, let's go back here. And I will tell you what I want us to do. And please flip back to Slido. Thank you. And let's look at the last two sessions. We are almost there. You've been a very great audience, and I'm grateful. Okay? And then I'll open up the platform for questions. Yes. It's not actually a question, but it's comments. Um, I read a paper on um, the influence of uh, Twitter on citation. Yes. And the author seems to find that there is an effect of uh, the, the author who tweet their paper on the citation score of their paper. Yes. And there is also uh, idea repack uh, ranking economist uh, with regard to the Twitter follower. Yes. Which means that they are considering uh, social media in uh, in the ranking of uh, research. Yes. Uh, if you look at uh, Science Direct, they also index the social media share uh, if the paper is uh, already shared That's on, right. on social media. That's right. Uh, and um, there is also uh, a use of social media as a data source to undertake research that's yes. growing yes and i think that in the future that will be uh, a source of uh, data especially for african country where the data is scant correct sir yeah that's uh, my main call oh absolutely i mean is absolutely spot on the research i told you i started in the heart of the pandemic i didn't leave my house right by march 2020 my brother can you let me go to slide do online not the slide. Thanks. From March 2020, thank you very much. From March 2020 till about last year, when I came back from sabbatical, I didn't have to leave my house. And the, the amount of data we collected, we were able, I was able to collect data of almost 12,000 students globally. In my university, within a period of two, three months, I collected data on 4,434 students, real time. By the time the global pandemic was actually getting to about October, I had a data overload. Okay? And, I told, and all the data I collected was online. And of course, I had ethics, all the ethics learners, everything, I did everything online, and I didn't have to leave my house. And I was writing and publishing and doing analysis from home. So the COVID pandemic is an opportunity, depending on how we look at it. So this is the next question. You can, QR code, you can scan the QR code and answer the, awkward, the question. So how effective was this presentation in persuading you of the importance of social media in research communication. Remember, I don't know who you are. Just be honest. If you are not persuaded, just tell me you are not persuaded. And I won't take offense. I will still greet you. 
<laughs> I won't take offense. Okay? Nine has answered and everybody says it's very effective. Okay? Thank you. I'm at least expecting maybe like nine, six more responses, if you don't mind. Eleven now, very effective. Okay, thank you. Very effective. This is very good. Okay, very effective. We are almost there. Okay? Remember, we won't, we won't exceed the time. So I have 12 responses, and everyone is saying it's very, 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 very effective. And just what my brother said from Burkina Faso slash France, if you want to increase your citation index, use social media. People will be downloading your research like they are watching TikTok. You'll be shocked. Okay? So 15 responses and nobody said somewhat effective or not effective. Very good. I think I've achieved my goal. But there's one more question. And that is the question. Okay? So what practical assistance will you require in establishing and professionally utilizing social media for the purpose of communicating your research? In this place, I'm asking you, what help do you need? Okay? Remember Professor Adelegan and I, when we were actually planning for this, we, were not, we know you are all researchers, and we know you, many of, most of, literally all of you have a PhD. And we respect that. And we know you are also very busy people. We don't just want to come and be talking above your head. And we don't need you to be bored. Okay? And that's the reason why we're working with you in this very deliberate manner. Okay? Mentorship. Okay? I see mentorship. Thank you. What can, and be practical. You can ask. You can ask anything. You know? This is data I'm going to use. This is data Professor Adelega and I we are going to use in the next coming day. So selecting the best platform to direct traffic to your work and research, okay? Security, profile setting, okay? Happy to, happy to speak to that. What else? How to identify and use the most effective social platform, okay? Not a problem. Training on technical aspects of social media, very good, thank you. What else? Mentorship on online research and use of social media, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, how to efficiently use social, uh, use professional social media sites like Twitter, LinkedIn, and selecting the best social media website. Absolutely, thank you. Identifying the best platform. Thank you, brilliant. Okay, thank you. What else? I have eight responses so far. I'm expecting more, at least additional seven. Because we are going to use this data. So can you see I'm not just talking the talk, I'm walking the talk. Okay? I, all I'm doing is to use social media. So I'm, not, I'm using social media to present and at the same time using social media to gather data from you. So, so keep an active account, yes. Active account. Profile setting and people to follow, okay, thank you. I will speak to that. Impact tracking from social media, I will actually speak to that. Okay. There are 11 responses so far. Let's add additional four. Please. Let's add additional four. Brilliant. Okay. Consistency. Thank you very much. So there are 12 responses. I'm happy with this. My brother, you can, can you flip back now, okay? Dealing with negative feedback, making your existing professional, profile professional, okay, not a problem. So can you go back now to the slides, please? Thank you. Absolutely fine. Thank you. So this is the conclusion. I am arguing that there is huge amount of data that is produced on social media. And because of the amount, can you see, you are, I'm sure you are wondering how are you responding and I'm getting the answer in real time, okay? That's the power of social media. How many of you have seen this happen before? Good. Brilliant. So, so social media, remember what I said, at any point in time as a researcher, you are like a seller. You are selling something. 
How you sell it is, now, is what matters, not just what you are selling. So, I'm saying when you use social media appropriately and professionally, social media channels can multiply the influence of your research communication. I'm grateful for your attention. I'm finishing since 17 minutes earlier so that I can give the floor back to Professor Adelegon. And you can download um, this presentation. Next. Okay. If you scan the QR code, you can download this presentation now. So scan the QR code, and automatically this presentation will come to your phone just now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Uju. I'm sure we all had very insightful uh, presentation on the use of social media. Without any doubt, <laughs> everyone is convinced that he's, he has um, a grasp of this domain. And um, he will still be coming up again, I think, um, tomorrow uh, to take a session on drafting blogs and other communication materials and a couple of other things tomorrow. So in the meantime, we have um, a health break, 3.45 to 4. And um, after that, please, we all come back at 4. And there's going to be a practical exercise, like we have said. And um, we all need to get a flip chart. We're going to give the protocol at the time so that we can do the title and executive summary today. Then the other presentation that I've not made, would we'll possibly try to do that tomorrow morning where we move into designing templates and all that. Okay, this um, module, this session is over for now and um, head break. Thank you. Can it can it be turned? They can uh there are four we can put these two there is one here and another. No one all of them to be working at the same time. Can they tear it? Yeah, we have teared two ah, very the good, walls, very good. then there are two ah, thank you very much. So we have it here. So you take the marker and um, you're gonna do your topic and also start writing the executive summary. And um, we'll give you like um 15 minutes to do that because I know that a couple of us have developed our policy briefs, uh, draft one, so you do that. After you are done with that, 15 minutes from now, uh, we're going to have a group. Uh, Dr. Ojo will work with the group on, um, or we just divide the group. We have um, the challenge we're going to have is a group uh, that is virtual. Uh, I don't know how we're going to do that. We'll think about that. Let them start. Let's start working now. I will talk to Dr. You can try on what we're going to do about that. So you start working on that. After that, the intention is to have um, uh, maybe inclusive finance come together uh, uh, in one corner. We have climate change in one corner. I don't know if the, if the IT people can help us with that. And, um, and the other group also. There's a the COVID related and um, he will start looking at, he will work with some group, we decide on that. I will work with some group and that's basically what we do to readjust and all that. But for the executive summary, um, some of us might need to have um, photographs and then um, what I think we can do is if you can get the picture ready, uh, I've not discussed it with um, Cecilia, but maybe I would think that if you send it to her, 
uh, if we send it to there, they can help us to print. Thank you very much. So they can help to print. Cecilia can help us to print. So in principle, if you write it, you might want to print a photo picture here, either vertical or horizontal landscape or vertical. If you decide to do that, so the intention is that by tomorrow you're having when we're having. Let me see. By we'll continue that exercise so that by the third day when we're having submission of training workshop deliverables. No, uh, by 10.45 on the third, we're having presentation of training workshop deliverables. So we're hoping that by that time, we'll be able to have presentation from every one of us, everyone on your policy brief. <laughs> You're going to have it uh, in this flip chart, maybe two chats together. You're going to present. Everybody will present. But we'll have refined it between now and the third day. And at the end of the day, you will, at the same time where you're working on the flip chart, you will also be doing your soft, soft copy. And um, that is the deliverable we are uh, providing to uh, the organizer of the program. That's AERC. So we'll start today and um, start working on it. So we'll have the flip chart in different corners. And then I'll suggest that, how many of us are, in, um, are doing COVID? COVID only online, they are in the other group. Oh, they're in the other group, very good. So and finance. Very good. The COVID who are there are online. Very good, very good. Oh, but the COVID are online? Yes. Okay, very good. So what we can do is that, for some of us that are here, climate change and inclusive finance, we can have... Um, Basically, we can have how many of us are here? Six, uh, 16. Please, can you have let's count? One, one, okay, let's pick a number. Let's pick numbers. 14. Okay, let's pick numbers. So, please, can we pick numbers? One, Very good. So 14, right? So 1 to 7 will be in one corner. Then 8 to 14 will be in another space. Maybe some there and some here. So I will uh, take care of the first group, 1 to 7, and Dr. Ojo will take care of the other group. So what you do is you start writing now. We give you 15 minutes to write. You paste. So after you finish writing 15, 20 minutes, I will come around, you do the presentation, uh, we stand, we'll stand, we'll be standing, you do the presentation, I will give comments, feedback, so that we can reshape it based on the theoretical framework, the theoretical component, or the frame, structural frames for policy brief that we've taught today. So that's what we're gonna do. So tomorrow, we'll possibly move to another exercise where we'll look at um, the con the contextual, you know, the third element, the contextual uh, framework of it, and then we go a uh, summary of evidence like that, and hopefully, I'll hope that by tomorrow, we can complete this task, because the program is so tight, because on the third day, we are having the presentation by 10.45. We'll possibly create more time tomorrow, maybe the night or 9.30, I'll do some presentation on the rest of the, of the uh, structural frames for policy briefs and how to design the template. And after that, I will give quite some time between 9 and 10.30 so that we can work on some. And also we have, um, in fact, group individual presentations is already starting by 3 to 5 p.m. tomorrow. So it's quite busy. By 3 to 5 p.m. tomorrow, we're expected to have group to individual, basically individual presentation, not group presentation. We're not doing group presentation. And we're also expecting those online also to present. So we're not excluding those group. So whatever we need to do about the policy brief must be completed by 3.45 tomorrow. So I think let's start that now and improve and advance as we proceed. So those online, uh, they can also start working on that on their policy brief. Uh, the title and also the executive summary. 
But I'm not too sure we'll have time to take people online. Let's see how the thing evolves. You know, I'm going to discuss with the IT what we can do with the people, with the participants online on their presentation. So let's start, please. Practicality of that, we have different topics. Is it that one group should deal with one topic? What we are doing is um, practically to work with those of us here mm. with the flip charts. Those mm. online mm. will try to. You're working on your research paper. Okay, so it's actually, although we are in one group, but we are working on our respective yes, work. Respective research paper. We're not, mm. if we want to take a group work, is a problem because yeah, we will not true. have enough time. The time okay. is so short. We are giving group exercises, you will mm. not be able to deliver this because it's volume of work. So you're working on your research paper, introduction of a research paper, and the executive summary of your research paper based on what we have learned. Today. You mean the title and the executive summary? Yes, executive summary. And okay. if you need to provide a, 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 a photo, try to go for the photo you want to use. Mm -hmm. Because tomorrow, we are having another session with Dr. Ujo, and it's going to uh, facilitate how to create blogs, mm -hmm. how to create all these things we were talking about. You know, mm -hmm. and that's a practical session, which we are also going to ultimately create for mm -hmm. your project. Okay. <laughs> Because it's quite, it's quite tough. All right. So we don't have time for group to take. A, we thought about that before. That we take a particular paper, <coughs> dissect it, and but we don't have time for that. So let's have a hands on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then, for instance, I and they are working on the same project. Would that mean we should collaborate? If you're working together, you do want to. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. so the, the, the the idea is that at the end of this three days workshop, you have a policy brief that can be catchy and can be sold to policy makers. And we are happy, we are convinced about it. So if you're working together, you can work together in a group. You have 20 minutes to work about this. The most important thing is the, the interaction together. So we do that. So, um, so if you are working together, take one flip chart. Um, I know you are work, your student is not here. But she, she's, she's online. She's I want online. To, yeah, I want okay. to call. Okay. So the two of you can work Yeah, Regina, the, the afternoon. Since we have the breakaway now to work individual, uh, to work in groups, I was wondering, should we not do the same work together with you? How can we coordinate that? Okay, are you saying that uh, I can give you a Zoom link, then you open, you, you, you come on Zoom. Okay. L let's work on Zoom then. I hope it doesn't. All right, thanks.
please is is it possible for the slide that uh, had the that frame the policy brief frame yes. to be put for everyone to see as we write because then it has instructions on how to do the title the one you showed yes they can project that for us okay and online too for is those it on the, which one which one is it in the, the, the one that is talking summary. about the title and then the structure okay okay yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for Hi, Regina. Yes, I can, I can hear you. Um, so we're, we're in the meeting room, and uh, yeah. Will you open? You remember I sent you my older policy brief? Yeah, to adapt from. But I know that you did what you did in a hurry, but it's, yeah. But this presentation of today, are you able to, did you take note of the
So we are still busy reading. <laughs> we have not started writing. And we have 18 more minutes to go. Okay. Please, if you need my assistance or that of Dr. Ojo, just come.
We'll soon close now because it's almost five. So that um, there will not be opportunity for presentation. But by tomorrow in the morning, we'll start the presentation. We'll still try to do uh, the many um, theoretical, um, every, every, the theoretical, the structural elements. If I want to dig deep into that, I'll try to do that in the morning. But you start this. We are moving to another room. So four flip charts will be for each person. So by tomorrow, we'll start um, the presentation because we can't do that today. So that's what we are doing. So we are preparing to round, uh, round off because it's 4.57. So whatever you have done. Then one thing I don't want to forget. Please, if you have your, I want every person to have, oh sorry. I want every person to have a photo. A photo is very good. So that um, if you identify the photo, uh, if you think it is good enough, you can send it to Cecilia. It will help you. She will help you to print it because you are going to insert your photo into your policy brief document. We have a four flip chart for each person. You have her email address or whatever, how you send things. So you can send it to her. She will help you to print. Because I'm not too sure there's a printer here. Is there any printer here? Thank you very much. And those that are connected oh, online, you can do your own virtually. But those that are here, please, your photo, identify it that you want to put in your policy brief. Send it to Cecilia. We'll bring it for you tomorrow so that when you are doing this, we want you to insert a photo in the executive summary. So if you can achieve that, because by tomorrow, we must finish the policy brief. From The agenda is quite tight. So that on Friday, I will see that by 3 p.m. tomorrow, some of you are based, expected to be doing presentation of your policy brief. So I don't know how that is going to happen. But I expect that maybe if you can do that, but by third day, you start doing your presentation because that's a deliverable for this workshop. Thank you very much. So the session is over today. So. Sorry, can I ask a question? Yes. Yes. It's, ab it's, it's about the picture. Could, should it be a picture of what we took while we're in the field collecting data? Or you just want a picture that shows a framework of how, um, a picture of what will be relevant to the policy maker or the reader? Not, not what you obtain in the field, uh -huh. but what will be relevant uh -huh. to the policy maker. Okay. Not the field. Okay, I get it now.